Okay, hello everyone. Well, I'm going to do a Q&A here about our physics project and its uh, current status. And maybe I can start off by making a few remarks about things. So it's now been a year and a half since we launched our physics project and uh, introduced these models that um, uh, look to actually be successful description of kind of the low level machine code of our universe. And I was pretty sure we were onto the right thing back a couple of years ago. I'm now 100% certain we're onto the right thing. This is kind of how our physical universe works. And uh, the question now is to sort of, uh, how, do we, how do we really understand the implications of what we're finding? How do we connect them to other things that are known and so on? I would say a big thing that's been happening is the sort of successful connection of the things that come out of our models with the things that have been discovered, investigated in mathematical physics, particularly over the last, I don't know, 50 years or so, but probably going back maybe 100 years, um, the, the kind of the understanding, the kind of relationship between the way that our models work and the way that existing mathematical physics works. And this has been going very well, both in terms of content and in terms of the, the people involved and in terms of the way in which different communities of people involved with mathematical physics and so on have been uh, getting involved in understanding how our models relate to what they've done. And I think it's been a wonderfully synergistic situation because in, in many ways, our models provide a machine code that is sort of underneath the kinds of things that have been studied in mathematical physics. And the things that have been studied in mathematical physics kind of show us different directions and extensions that can be uh, possible on the basis of our kinds of models. So, you know, maybe I should just say a little bit about, uh, uh, okay, in terms, of, in terms of my sort of conceptual development from the things that we've been doing, I would say two big things have happened. One, I understand more and more about kind of uh, how to really think about these models that we have and how to really think about their relationship to physics. That's the first thing. The second thing is that I've realized that sort of inside these models is a meta idea that is more general than physics and can be applied to many other fields. And one of the things for me that I've been excited about is what I'm calling the multi-computational paradigm. Um, this kind of thing that's, that I'll talk about a little bit more here in a moment, um, that is kind of, is, is the meta model underneath these models of physics that we have. And that meta model, can now be applied, it seems, to a whole variety of other areas and really provides sort of a, a new paradigm for thinking about theoretical models in general, and it's applicable to a whole range of different areas. Okay, why is that interesting? Uh, one of the reasons that's particularly interesting is um, that uh, um, the, um, um, uh, the, the, I think we might have a wrong video here. Maybe somebody can fix that. Um, the, uh, um, one of the reasons that's particularly interesting is because physics has been so successful over the past hundred years. So there's a lot that we know from physics. So if we discover that the same fundamental paradigmatic model works between physics and let's say immunology or economics or linguistics or evolutionary biology, if we know that the same underlying paradigmatic models work in both those cases, then it allows us to take ideas and successes from physics and import them into those other areas, and also allows us to take things that are understood in those areas and for which we have intuition in those areas and apply them to physics. And so that the possibility by having the sort of common underlying paradigmatic model, we have this possibility of making that relation. Well, maybe I should say a little bit about, about kind of the way I think about our models of physics um, um, now. Um, the kind of the starting point, in a sense, for our whole way of thinking about physics and the universe and so on is sort of what's the universe made of? And in sort of the traditional view of that has been, well, the first thing we just introduce in things is space. And space is just something that is, and we can put things at different positions in space and so on. But there's no question you ask about what's space made of. 
the sort of the starting point for our whole uh, set of models is to think, well, actually, it's made of something. What's it made of? It's made of these discrete elements. These elements have the only thing about them is their identity, that this, this element is distinct from that element. Then there are relations between these elements and the way that we are imagining these relations work, and it turns out to be a very nice, flexible way to do it, it's just there's a relation between elements. There are three elements, they are related. It's element one, element two, element three, they're all related. And there's an order to that relation. Um, it's, you now you can imagine other ways to represent the relations between elements. For example, you could say, let's put the elements and leaves of a tree. Instead of having them be a list effectively, that uh, in having sort of the, the, the fundamental data structure be this list that says element one, element two, element three, element four, whatever, those are related, that relation is just that list. You could say, well, have them be related more like an expression in Wolfram language where it's a tree structured thing. Or you could have a variety of other kinds of relations. Or for example, those, um, uh, you could say, well, those elements are really uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a string where there, there's a sequential order and, um, and you're, you're just sort of splicing things into the string. There are a variety of different kinds of structures. The one that we've that we that I realized, uh, what was it, two and a half years ago or something, was a was a good one to think about. Is this kind of the most minimal structure? Just this, it's a sequence in order of these elements, and you just have this this whole collection of relations between elements. Now, everything else that one might think about in terms of trees, you can just use Polish notation or something to turn a tree into that kind of list. You can always think about these different kinds of structures as just these kinds of list things, but maybe there are other structures that are convenient to introduce for purposes of particular kinds of modeling that they allow you to see things more clearly. But sort of the first thing is, it's just a bunch of elements and these elements have relations between them. We can think about those relations between elements as hyper edges in a hypergraph. And then we can say, well, what is the universe? What is the universe? What, what is it made of? space in the universe is then this giant hypergraph in which there are these elements which we can think of in a, in a sort of uh, uh, slightly uh, assuming the answer kind of way as atoms of space. They are the, the ultimate elements that make up space. And then the whole structure of space is defined by this, this big hypergraph. What is this thing mathematically? What is that, that giant limiting hypergraph? We're slowly making progress in understanding that. Things to say about that hypergraph are, you could say, well, what you could imagine, let, let's say the hypergraph was just something where every, where all these elements were just connected in like a grid. We could easily say, okay, the limit of that thing is something like a two-dimensional, uh, just, just a two-dimensional manifold that's defined by this kind of, um, uh, where at a very microscopic level, it will be this grid, but on a larger scale, it can be thought of as just a continuous manifold, which locally approximates Euclidean space. But the question is, what, what is that limiting hypergraph? What is that, when the hypergraph gets very big, what is it like? It's, as, as we'll see, because in our models, there is dynamics that makes the hypergraph, what we get is not an arbitrary random hypergraph, it's an algorithmically created hypergraph. But we can start asking, what can we say about the general limit of a very large hypergraph? And we can ask things like, what's the effective dimension of that hypergraph? If we start from a point and we just say, what's the volume of a ball with radius R around that point? We imagine that, that the volume of that ball grows like R to the D, where D we can identify as the dimension. And so then we can, and then we can look at other kinds of ways to, to, uh, uh, to look at these kinds of limits of what is the effective limit of that hypergraph. Okay, the, 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 the whole story of what those limits are like is a very complicated story. I think one of the things that we have to think about is uh, this idea that sometimes the limit of this hypergraph is a manifold, something which is locally like ordinary Euclidean space, but sometimes it's what we might call a hyperfold, some other kind of thing where it's not so clear what that limit is really like and where it's not clear what model we can take for a little infinitesimal region of that object. So that's one of the challenges. But when we think about calculus, calculus is a story of, well, you know, it's a story of what happens when you have a certain number of variables which can be changed 
incrementally, so to speak, where you can say, what's, what does the result of an infinitesimal change of this variable or that variable? In our kind of hypergraph setup, there are no variables. There's a, in, if you have a, a space which can be identified as an integer number of dimensional space, you can say, well, there's this X coordinate and Y coordinate and so on. But in our hypergraphs, there is no such thing. We're operating at a lower level. And so we need to build this kind of infra calculus thing, which is kind of like a calculus that can work not just in an integer number of dimensions, but on this kind of hyperfold limiting kind of object. And the mathematics of that is, um, is something difficult. It's something that uh, people are, are now starting to work on. Um, it's something that um, I think will be a very interesting and rich area of mathematics. It's sort of a, a generalization of calculus. It's kind of a, 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 a next step beyond traditional sort of calculus operating with with integer numbers of variables and so on. But okay, so, so sort of the first sort of level of thinking is about the structure of space. Then we talk about time. The, the sort of the fundamental idea here is there are rules that say a piece of hypergraph that looks like this is gonna get transformed to a piece that looks like that. In a sense, those rules, uh, it, it's worth saying that there really isn't a difference between the structure of those rules. Well, maybe we'll come to this in a bit. Um, the, 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 one of, the, the sort of a question of what's the difference between the objects that one's working on and the transformations that occur on those things. In sort of a category theory point of view, it's the objects versus the morphisms and so on. But in what we're thinking about here is, and, and you can kind of bring those together in various ways, but you know, what is time? Time is this inexorable way in which this hypergraph is being updated. Whenever there is a piece of hypergraph that matches this particular pattern, transform it into this other piece of hypergraph. And so the progress of time is a progress of that, that happening um, at, at sort of whenever it can happen, so to speak. And then a big point is that there are, in general, many different places in the hypergraph where these updates could occur. So it's not like a, a situation where in which there's a sort of a single thread of time where one's just saying, first it's in this state, then we know it's going to go to this definite state and then this definite state and so on. All over this hypergraph, there are different updates that can be happening. And there's a question of which order those updates happen in. In a sense, what we're, what we're saying is there are multiple threads of time that are determined by the different possible orderings in which those updates can occur. And this is, this is one of the technically most difficult pieces to this whole story, and one that we've been progressively working on, I think making rather good progress on, but it's definitely got, to, got a ways to go. This question of when you have this, you have kind of a state of the universe defined by some particular hypergraph, and then it can be updated to some other state of the universe, but it could also be updated to a different state because some different uh, piece, of, some different transformation was applied. So you get this whole multi-way graph that says from this state, you can get to these two other states, from those two states, you can get to other states and so on. Much of the time there are branches in that multi-way graph because there are different possible updates that could happen, but sometimes there are also merges. Now that process of merging is a very subtle, but very important one. What does it mean to say that two different states of the universe wind up as the same state of the universe? What it means sort of mathematically might be that, oh, we've got these two hypergraphs when they're different, but with, with these different transformations that are applied to them, they wind up being the same hypergraph. What does it mean the same hypergraph? It means it's an isomorphic hypergraph. It means from a kind of a, a, a sort of implementational point of view, if we'd label the nodes in the hypergraph by one, two, three, four, five, and so on, there is a relabeling of nodes such that one hypergraph is identical to the other hypergraph. But when we think about that for the universe, and we say, well, there's this branching of different possible states of the universe, but sometimes those states of the universe end up being equivalent, it's like, that's a, and the way we're, we're thinking about it is the universe sometimes branches, sometimes merges. Um, that notion of equivalence is, is something that really is driving a lot of the model and is what we'll come to talking about what that equivalence really corresponds to. Um, 
But the, the big picture is there are these different sort of threads of time. There is these different threads of evolution that can happen, which branch and merge and so on. Those are, in a sense, different threads of time. People might ask, how many dimensional is time? You know, time is seems to us very one dimensional. But in this kind of model, what's happening is there are all these different threads of time. And so time is, is kind of uh, 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 is, is progressing through all these threads. OK, so now one of the things that I've increasingly realized, we've increasingly realized, is what's really important about what's happening in the universe is not, in a sense, what is happening at the lowest level, what the machine code really is. What's really important is when we, as observers of the universe, who happen to also be embedded in the universe, observe what's happening in the universe, what do we conclude is happening? In other words, as observers who are made of the same stuff that the universe is made of, what is our impression of what the universe is doing? And what I've increasingly realized is that the laws of physics as we know them are a lot about the way in which we sample and we parse what is ultimately underlying happening in the universe. The universe has all these transformations being applied to these relations in these hypergraphs and so on. At least that's a way to think about it. There are different formulations you can give of the exact same ultimate setup, but that's a convenient and very concrete one. And that's happening. It's happening all over the place. And it's generating all these different threads of time. And it's generating this, this complicated sort of limiting hyperfold object and so on. And, but the question is, what do we notice from all of that? Now, one of the things about what's happening at that lowest level is that there is computation going on. All of these updates, they are effectively uh, steps in a computation. That computation has this feature of being what I call computationally irreducible. It's something where you can't really know the outcome of many, many steps by any better procedure than effectively just following each step and seeing what happens. Well, one of the things that that might suggest is if that's the way the universe ultimately works, that it's full of computationally irreducible processes, how can it be that we live our lives and do what we do and that the universe seems to have predictable features, even seems to have general natural laws and so on? How can that be? If everything is computationally irreducible, how can there be sort of coherent natural laws for the universe? And how can there be any predictability that we make use of in sort of living our lives and so on? So this is one of the big surprises of, of our project, and I sort of slowly understand it better and better, that one of the things that is always true is that within any system that is ultimately computationally irreducible, there are always kind of slices and pockets of computational reducibility. And what I increasingly realize is that the story of our observation of this underlying computational universe, so to speak, is that we are essentially sampling certain aspects of that universe that, are, that have features of computational reducibility. So now the question is, okay, we're observers of this very complicated universe that's doing all these computational things. What aspects, what attributes do we as observers have that are important in the way that we parse and understand the universe? And I think there are two. One of them is that we are computationally bounded observers. Yes, the universe is doing all this computation underneath, but we can't, we can't sort of cotton on to all of that. And that's kind of inevitable because we're part of the universe. And in a sense, it's inevitable that we can only do the computations that are associated with our sort of bounded part of the universe. But it's more than that. It's that, that we, only, we are only uh, kind of paying attention to, we're only able to tease out those aspects of the universe that are something that can be done by a computationally bounded observer. So it's, it's like saying, you know, you've got some image made of a bunch of pixels and there are little details of what's happening with those pixels. And many of those details are not things that we, with our visual systems and just sort of interpreting the picture that we notice. Those are details that we don't notice. We've seen a similar thing in physics and it's an important analogy that I use a lot. Um, which is to statistical mechanics. Um, in when we think about, I don't know, molecules of a gas, the molecules are all bouncing around. We might have 10 to the 20th molecules in a small region of gas. They're all bouncing around. And they have a lot of, all their motions are very determined by particular 
laws of classical mechanics and so on. Um, but that's, we are not, as observers of the gas, we're not tracing all of those detailed collisions and motions of those 10 to the 20th molecules. What we're doing is we're looking at certain coarse grained kinds of computationally bounded things that we can measure. Like what's the overall density of gas molecules in this particular region, or what's the average velocity of gas molecules in this particular region, and so on. We're looking at these coarse-grained, computationally bounded aspects of this underlying dynamical, uh, underlying sort of molecular dynamics that's going on. And what that means is when we talk about how do gases behave, what we're talking about is how do gases behave to us as observers who are making these coarse-grained measurements. So we might say, well, a gas follows the gas laws, or you see the laws of fluid mechanics applied to the, the motion of gases and so on. Or more, more extremely, you see the second law of thermodynamics, the law that says that the typical configuration of the gas can be described as a high entropy configuration, that the typical configuration of the gas is typical of all possible configurations of the gas. Well, in a sense, that is a consequence, the fact that we observe the second law of thermodynamics is a consequence of the way that we act as observers. It is a consequence of the computational boundedness of our way of observing a gas. Because if we weren't computationally bounded, we'd be tracing every little, we could potentially be tracing every little collision of every molecule and so on and so on and so on. And so then, for example, if we say, well, you know, is this configuration of molecules of the gas typical of all possible configurations? Well, actually, no, it's not, because it came from this thing where all the molecules of the gas were on one side of the box. And look, we can trace step by step, detail by detail, how it came to be that the configuration we now have was one that was very special because it came from something where all the molecules were on one side of the box. But because we are operating as computationally bounded observers, because we're making only these coarse grained computationally bounded measurements, then it turns out to be the case that the very phenomenon of computational irreducibility in the gas prevents us from being able to detect those special features. Because there's computational irreducibility in this underlying dynamics, and because we are only able to sample it in a computationally bounded way, we therefore conclude that the second law of thermodynamics is true. So, you know, the future aliens or something, or the, 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 you know, the alien organisms might not conclude that the second law of thermodynamics is true because they might be measuring their sensory apparatus may measure something completely different from what we measure. Now, that might sound like science fiction, but it isn't entirely science fiction. And I've realized this uh, recently because it turns out this whole phenomenon of, uh, uh, if there's a question when you are doing chemical reactions, when you're looking at molecular biology, for example, what is the relevant form of observer for molecular biology? You've got all these molecules bouncing around, they're all interacting with each other and so on. One thing you can say is all we care about is the overall concentration of certain kinds of, of, of compounds or certain kinds of molecules. And, and we don't care about all the details of this collided with that and there was this kind of causal relationship between this collision event and that other one and so on. We don't care about any of that stuff. We just care about overall concentrations. And that is like a typical coarse-grained observer of the kind that we normally are uh, looking at that kind of chemical system. Is that in fact how biology observes a chemical, uh, that molecular biology system? It's not obvious. You know, there are detailed things where things are being interacting with membranes and particular molecules are being uh, sort of uh, interacting with some cell surface in this way, and there's particular molecular processes that are doing things, it's not obvious that, that our typical coarse-grained observations of a gas that lead us to things like the second law of thermodynamics are actually correct for actually apply to things at the molecular biology kind of scale. So that's a place where it actually matters what our model for the observer is. But as I say, the first kind of feature of the observer of physics and of many other things is the observer is computationally bounded. And the computational boundedness of the observer in the case of molecular dynamics um, is what leads to the second law of thermodynamics and so on. By the way, that, that explanation of the second law of thermodynamics is something I kind of developed in slightly less crisply in the 1990s. And uh, it's sort of a strange piece of personal history that the 
the thing that first got me really interested in fundamental physics was back in 1972 when I was 12 years old, a long time ago, this kind of book cover that showed this kind of simulated gas molecules bouncing around and purported to show sort of the operation of the second law of thermodynamics. And that was the thing that got me to write my first uh, computer simulation program and, and all kinds of things. And it's, it's kind of ironic that now I'm still talking about the second law of thermodynamics, but I think it, it's something where, where we now actually have a pretty good understanding of how that works in this kind of computational way. But so first, first thing about us as observers of the universe is we're computationally bounded. That has the consequence that we will uh, that, that that that's that we, we are then sampling certain computationally. Uh, okay, so as computationally bounded observers, we are able to detect certain aspects of this kind of complicated multi-computational, multi-way kind of process. Okay, there's one other really important attribute I think of us as observers, which is that we sequentialize time. So I've said that you know, in this multi-way graph, there are all these different threads of time. They're branching, they're merging, they're doing all these different kinds of things. But that's not how we perceive the universe. We perceive the universe as being something in which there is a definite single thread of time. So when people say, is time one-dimensional? The answer is, yes, it is to us, because we make it that way. We believe that time is one-dimensional. We, we conflate together all these different things that might be these different threads of time. As far as we're concerned, we only uh, talk about this, this kind of one thread of time. And that sequentialization of time uh, allows us to only sample certain aspects of this complicated multi-way graph and all the different things that are going on. Those aspects, those two things together, computational boundedness and sequentialization of time, I believe those two things are what give us general relativity and quantum mechanics. And there are many technical details, we can talk about some of those, but fundamentally, why is our observation of the universe such that we perceive space-time to follow the Einstein equations, we perceive quantum mechanics to follow the Feynman path integral and so on? The reason is, and by the way, those end up being essentially the same theory in our, in our models, essentially the reason is because we are observers who have these two attributes, computational boundedness and sequentialization in time. So it's, it's uh, one thing to say about our models of physics is one of the things that is extremely unobvious in our models of physics, at every moment, everything is being recreated. It is not the case that there are things in the universe which just sit there atoms of space that are very old and they've just been hanging around and they're just like doing their thing forever. At every moment, atoms of space are being ingested in events that rewrite them and new atoms of space are being created. So in that setup, it, one of the things to realize is the very fact that space and space time are a coherent thing is the result of all of those interactions. That is, space would not be a coherent knitted together thing were it not for all these microscopic interactions that are happening that are essentially knitting together the pieces of space. And in fact, what seems to be the case is that the vast majority of the activity in the universe is concerned with essentially the knitting together of the pieces of space. And those aspects of the universe, which we uh, understand as photons and electrons and all those kinds of things, we'll talk about it more about how those arise in our models, those aspects are just a little piece of froth on the top of this, this sort of giant activity of knitting together the structure of space. It's kind of like if you're a fluid, in, in a fluid, you might have a vortex in the fluid that's a little bit like what we imagine. Uh, things like particles are these sort of persistent, uh, uh, essentially topologically stable things that exist in this hypergraph. But the vast majority of what's happening in the fluid is all of the collisions between all the underlying microscopic molecules. And there's just this little effect that is this kind of vortex that's, uh, that's trundling along in the fluid. Those little effects are what we mostly perceive about the universe. The, below it are all these molecular details which are associated with the knitting together of the structure of space, all this computational irreducibility. We're just observing this sort of little piece at the top that is this computationally reducible piece, which can be described by our laws of physics and so on. So a thing, and, and by the way, okay, so another thing that we want to talk about is, 
So the very fact that we have this impression that there's a coherence in time is not trivial because things are being rewritten all the time. So the fact that there is this notion that there is some permanence to things in the universe, that things persist in the universe, it might not be that way. It might be the case if we were in a gas, for example, on a molecular scale, it might be the case that any structure, you know, oh, we've got these molecules dancing around in this particular way, but a moment later, they're not doing that anymore. There's nothing permanent there. Only things like the vortices that sort of are at the top level, kind of, uh, you know, sitting on top of all that microscopic detail, those are the only things that persist. And they persist for kind of subtle topological reasons, so to speak, that are kind of emerge from all of this underlying detail. And, and so it is, I think, with, with our universe. But the fact that we sequentialize time in the way we do is why we sort of attribute to the universe a certain degree of permanence which we wouldn't if we were really looking down at the microscopic level of the atoms of space. Same kind of thing with motion. It's not obvious when you take an object and you move it. It's, it is not the case that the moved object is, the, is in some sense the same atoms of space as you started from. As you move, you are essentially recreating that object with different atoms of space. It's a little bit the same thing, a wave and a fluid, you know, that wave as it moves, the detailed molecules that are in that peak of the wave are different molecules, but the wave as a, as a collective thing, you can say it, the wave is moving, the molecules and the wave maintains a certain coherence, but the molecules inside it are all getting turned over, so to speak. So, and so it is with motion in our universe, and the possibility of pure motion is not an obvious thing. Just like the possibility of transport of, of sort of existing through time is not an obvious thing. The possibility that you can have an object and move it and it's still the same when you moved it is not obvious. By the way, even in traditional physics, that's not quite such a trivial thing because by the time you're dealing with uh, curvature in space time and so on, and you take that object and you move it close to a black hole, close to a, a space-time singularity, for example, there is much distortion of the object. And it's not at all obvious that you should consider it the same object, so to speak. It is, in effect, an assumption that there is an idea of pure motion, that, that you can take an object and expect to move it around and consider it to be the same. But so this idea of motion, the idea of sequentialization in time, the idea of the assumption of pure motion, these are important things about our observation of the universe. If we were looking down at the level of the atoms of space, neither of these things would be things that we would pay attention to. But given that we are at the level that we're at, we can start thinking about phenomena, for example, in relativity of, um, for example, time dilation. That's one that, that I think we can understand very nicely. Uh, what's essentially happening, you've got an object and it's sitting somewhere in space and it is updating itself, and it's spending a bunch of computation updating itself. That's ultimately, there is a certain rate at which computation happens to the atoms of space. We can estimate that rate at some, some ridiculously, it's, it's kind of fun because the units of computation in the universe, you have to assign units to how many operations per second is the universe doing? What is an operation? Well, you know, for fun, you can say it's, you know, Wolfram language tokens consumed per, per second or something. And it's some huge, huge number um, that one can estimate it might be for the universe. But ultimately, there is a certain rate of computation getting done in the universe. And to an object, there's a certain rate at which uh, the, the, um, uh, the computation happens. Okay, so uh, if the object is just sort of sitting in one place, it's as that, that, that rate of time progressing of the object being updated is a certain rate determined by sort of the computation that the universe can supply for that object. Now let's say we move the object. Well, there are two things that have to happen. One is as the object moves, it has to be essentially recreated at different places in space. And that takes some computational effort. And so what's happening is that some of the computational effort that might be going into just the time evolution of that object is actually going into recreating the object at a different place in space. And so that's why, that's the sort of a mechanical intuitive explanation for why time dilation happens in relativity. It's that when things are moving, that you are effectively using some of your computational ability to update the thing at a different place, as well as updating it through time. 
So in a sense, time goes more slowly. Time appears to go more slowly for that object because some of the computation that would be associated with the progression of time is going into recreating the object at a different place in space. Now, that's a sort of intuitive level description of what's going on. It's a bit more subtle than that in reality, partly because this notion of there's sort of an absolute space and you're sitting here and you're moving there, that's not really the right story. It doesn't, the, the, there is no absolute space with respect to, you know, there are these atoms of space. Um, you can say, well, I've got, I've captured this atom of space. I've, I've got, this is my place in the universe. It's these collection of atoms of space. But as I just mentioned, the atoms in space are not permanent. They're things which are just being ingested continuously and continuously recreated by these actual processes of, of transformations. And so there is no notion of saying it's just here in space. Instead, all one can really talk about is the network of events that happen in space. And what one can say is this, these, this event that happened here was causally related, was necessary to have happened before this other event that happened and so on. And so you build up this network of events, this causal graph of events that happen, of transformations that happen to the atoms of space. And it's really in that context that you have to think about kind of things like motion and so on. It's a little trickier to think that through. And that, that the fact that one's dealing with this causal graph rather than dealing with the sort of raw atoms of space, that's why ultimately all the Lorentz invariants and all those other features of relativity work out in our models. And it's, it's perhaps worth saying, the, um, when we talk about these causal graphs, we can think about this in a very computational way. Every event is taking certain hyperedges, certain relations between atoms of space. It's taking those as input, it's grinding them up, and it's making new hyperedges. Well, what's that like? It's like a function in a, in, in, a, in a computational language, for example. It takes certain inputs, it grinds them up, it produces certain outputs. That's And so what's happening in this causal graph, it's saying that these functions there, the input to one function needs the output from some other function. And that defines in this causal graph a certain partial order. It defines a certain way in which there has to be an ordering between these events. That's what the causal graph is associated with. So the story of the causal graph, uh, the other feature of the causal graph is, well, how intense are these events? In a particular region of space, what is the density of update events? How much activity is there in a particular region of space? Now, defining that is a little tricky because you have to have the sort of denominator of that. You have to know how big, you know, you can say, well, there's this number of events happening, but how big a region of space are those events happening in? And in a sense, the events themselves are defining the size of the region of space. So it's a little, there's a little bit of trickiness there. But when you untangle that, the, the sort of big thing that we knew back a couple of years ago now is that energy is associated with the density of activity in our hypergraph. So in a sense, what we say is that the, 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 you know, the interpretation of energy, which I had no, I did not imagine that it would be anything like this simple, that the interpretation of energy is essentially, it is the density of events that are happening in this, it's the amount of activity in this network. The amount, the energy density is sort of the amount per unit physical volume. Again, tricky to define exactly what that means. And a little bit more accurately, it's saying that energy is the flux of causal edges through space-like hypersurfaces. That is through, through uh, we, we identify a certain uh, thing to be, well, I, I should have said that as we sequentialize time, we are saying that there are, when we sequentialize time, we're effectively saying there are these events that happen across space and we say those happen at a particular time. And we are creating this collection of space-like hypersurfaces. We are foliating space-time with this collection or foliating our causal graph with this collection of space-like hypersurfaces, which define those, the, the, each space-like hypersurface says, these events are all to be considered to be just different places in space at a particular time. And there's a whole stack of this a whole foliation of this collection of space-like hypersurfaces, they define the progression of time. And it's the idea that there is just a stack of space-like hypersurfaces that is our representation of the sequentialization of time. You could have something where, there, where you just say there are all these different threads of time going on, but no, you're not doing that. You're saying, I want to consider it to be 
all of space at a particular time, then all of space at the next time, and so on. Now, by the way, that view that space, that time is sequentialized in that way, and it's sort of all of space at a particular moment in time, it's interesting to realize why we humans think that that's a reasonable model of what's going on. And the basic answer is that in our typical everyday experience, we might see 100 meters away from us. It doesn't take light long to go 100 meters. So what we see from the, the, you know, the scene that we're looking at, in a sense, we see that whole scene instantaneously because the speed of light is fast compared to the speed at which our brains process information. So to our brains, we're seeing this kind of uh, the, the behavior of the world as it's a series of moments in time for all space, or at least for all space that we can readily see around us. So we, we, we can think of it as just these space-like hypersurfaces where all of space is kind of conflated together and said, what happened in all of space at this moment in time? Then at the next moment in time, what happened in all of space at this moment in time? If we were a different size in our physical universe and or had very different brain processing speeds, we wouldn't be able to do this. If we were the size of, I don't know, you know, a planet or something, um, the speed of light would really be an important feature. And we wouldn't be able to say, oh, we just consider this to, you know, we, we, we ignore the speed of light. We assume that, that we are seeing the instantaneous state of space at a particular moment in time. So that feature of us as observers is a consequence. It's an important consequence of sort of a, a fundamental characteristic of us and sort of our size and our nature within the universe, so to speak. So anyway, the, the, the thing that um, uh, has been happening there is um, understanding kind of, um, uh, you know, energy. Oh, another, another thing to say is um, you can start asking questions about, uh, okay, so, so energy is what, and mass, is what produces, according to Einstein's equations, is what produces curvature in space-time. And in our models, that's incredibly direct. You can basically see that when there is more activity in the network, more specifically in this causal graph, you can see that that directly implies that there is additional curvature. What is curvature? Curvature is if you ask, uh, start from a given node in this graph, uh, and well, okay, in the causal graph, what's happening is once an event has happened, there's a cone, a light cone of events that can be affected by that event. And if you start asking, well, how many events really are, are there in that light cone? You can do the same thing that we talked about with balls in, in space, and you can ask what's the effective dimension of that light cone, and then the, the sort of correction to the, the growth of that light cone uh, with, with time, the correction to that gives you the effective curvature of space-time associated with that light cone. And so what ends up happening is that that curvature is then related to the, the density of activity in that light cone. And it's a, it's a sort of very direct relation between these things. And so that's, that's why essentially Einstein's equations are true. A way to think about it is this. Imagine that, so a big piece of how, how does gravity work? Well, we say, well, what would happen to something moving through space if there wasn't gravity? Well, it would just go in a straight line. It goes in the shortest path a GD sick is, is def and you can define that perfectly well on a hypergraph. You can just say the GD sick is the path that has the smallest number of hyper edges to get from this point to this other point. So then what happens is that the presence of activity in the network makes the shortest path not be a straight path. It, it deflects that path. And that deflection is the effect of, of gravity in our models. Now, one, one thing I should say is what's really nice is that I can give you these kind of intuitive level, almost mechanical descriptions of what's going on. But what's also really nice is that below those descriptions are nice, elegant mathematical descriptions, which turn into discussions about Ritchie curvature and discussions about uh, you know, metric tensors and all these kinds of things. And the whole apparatus of general relativity, for example, gets wheeled in and connected to what we're talking about here. And so it's, it's not, you know, you could, you could, the words are one thing, 
but the whole point is that there is a formal structure underneath which turns out to fit beautifully with the formal structure that we have known from general relativity for the last hundred or so years. So, but um, uh, what's nice is that one can actually start to have intuitive discussions about, for example, what happens to time in the presence of gravity? You know, does, does time, well, you know, when there's more activity in the network, in effect, there's more time, time is running more quickly when there's more activity in the network. And that's the thing that turns into things like the gravitational redshift and, and things like this when you untangle that in relativity. So these things which have seemed to be, oh, it's just an effect that we can get from the mathematics of space time and so on. Now we can get a sort of intuitive, almost mechanical understanding of what's going on there. And I think that's really neat. Um, and by the way, these effects, what is even more powerful is these exact same effects are gonna show up in all these other places that use the same underlying multi-computational paradigm. We'll talk about that in a moment. Okay, so one big area has to do with uh, general relativity and the structure of space-time. Uh, our understanding of black holes and so on has gotten a lot better. Uh, essentially what happens is in, so one of the questions is what pathological things can happen in space-time? One thing that can happen is you're going along, you're updating this hypergraph, it's all good. And then somehow you get to a situation where there are no more updates that can be done, where it's just stuck, time has stopped. That's actually what happens in the center of a non-rotating black hole. That is what the space-like singularity is in our models. It is a place where time has stopped, where effectively, the, if you were to think about these functions being applied, all of these events are the application of a series of functions, what that will be saying is you've reached a normal form, you've reached a fixed point. There is nothing more that can be done with evaluating these functions. Now, sort of interestingly enough, in, for example, Wolfram language, what we're doing is the fundamental way the language works is it is taking symbolic expressions that represent whatever you represent computationally, and it's applying transformations to those, and it keeps going until no more transformations can apply, until it reaches a fixed point. It's as if it keeps going until it reaches that space-like singularity, until it's, it's sort of what seems in, in relativity to be sort of the pathological situation of the space-time singularity in, in the center of a black hole is in our evaluation semantics of our computational language is what we are encountering all the time. We are getting to the point where time has stopped. And, but that's something that in physics, the place where time stops is in the center of black holes. In, in computation, the place where time stops is when you got your answer. And one thing about, about the physics case is that one of the features, so, so that time stopping thing is, is really a result of GD6 converging which is a result of having more energy, more mass in that place. And you can kind of see all these things all come together and they have sort of a mechanical interpretation of all this activity is causing the GD6 to deflect together. When the GD6 all converge together, that's the time when, when that's the place where all the GD6 are converging. To say that, that um, time continues is to say there is a path that keeps going. But this is saying, well, actually all paths come together and they all come together in a place where time has stopped. So that, that's kind of an interpretation of that. And that's um, uh, so a, a thing also to say about, about um, general relativity and so on is that in general relativity, one is starting off with the fundamental assumption that space-time is a manifold, that it is something which is like a continuous, a continuous manifold where you can microscope down and it'll be, you know, it'll be manifold all the way down, so to speak. That you can make it an infinitesimal sized thing will still look like a manifold. Okay, in our models, that's not the case. In our models, you can imagine a gravitational microscope that when it looks close enough, it will just see the atoms of space. It will no longer see uh, a continuum kind of thing. Well, in traditional general relativity, these singularities in space time are places where, whoops, the equations that describe space time no longer apply because they can't describe things like the, those, those singular places where things don't work the way that you expect in a manifold. 
in our models, you absolutely can describe those things. So we get to be have a more general kind of approach to our description of space time, in which, for example, you can change the topology of space time, you can make sort of, in a sense, continuous, although our whole model is a discrete model, changes in the topology of space time, you can change the dimension of space time, there are all kinds of effects I've talked about, about space tunnels associated with changing, locally changing the dimension of space and so on. And, and there's sort of a question, okay, okay, so how does this all work? Uh, well, okay, and another thing to think about, sort of the big picture is how, what is our model of space time? Ultimately, there are a bunch of atoms of space. They have all these relations. There are all these transformations. There are all these events. But it's a little bit like fluid mechanics in the sense that there are atoms of space, quotes, bouncing around. Not really, because that, that, that's a slightly different dynamics. But there are atoms of space interacting with each other. And that on a large scale, what we see is this continuum-like behavior, just like we can go from molecular dynamics and on a large scale see fluid mechanics. And in fact, many aspects of the derivation of general relativity from that microscopic structure of space are the same as derivations that I've done in the past of fluid behavior from underlying cellular automata and so on. It's the same kind of thing. The, the Einstein equations are the continuum limit of this kind of atomic molecular dynamics of atoms of space. So uh, particularly Jonathan Gorard has been uh, working on, on um, actually turning that kind of uh, sort of starting from the, 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 the sort of discrete structure and, and going to, to larger and larger scale discrete structures into a practical way of doing numerical relativity of actually simulating things like black hole mergers and so on. So how is that normally done? Well, what's normally done is you say, we've got the Einstein equations, they describe space time in terms of a manifold, but we're gonna put them on a computer. And so ultimately after a bunch of algebraic computation that usually gets done with Mathematica nicely enough, after a bunch of that, ultimately you are discretizing the things you get because that's the only way you can put them on a digital computer. And you're using numerical analysis to break up what would otherwise be this nice manifold described by the Einstein equations. And then you're solving that from a point of view of numerical analysis. The approach that we can take from our models is the opposite way around. We start from the atoms of space. We have a discrete description. It is our genuine description of what's going on. And then we can say, let's run it on a large enough scale that we see the approximate continuum behavior of the kind we really see. Now, the actual number of orders of magnitude might be 10 to the 100, uh, you know, it might be a factor of 10 to the 100 in, in scale size. Um, and obviously we don't get to simulate that on a practical computer. We can do only much tinier versions. But what Jonathan seems to be finding is that even with much tinier versions, it becomes a very practical way to do numerical relativity. And in fact, for example, it has a nice feature that in numerical relativity, you might say, oh, there's a place where the space time is, is very curved and changing very rapidly. Um, and uh, that's a place where you gotta use more grid points. Uh, well, in our models, the thing generates its own grid points because where there's energy density and where there's curvature, that is defined by the presence of more causal edges. And so in a sense, it makes its own adaptive mesh. And that's kind of a nice feature. Um, but uh, so one of the interesting frontiers is doing more accurate, more complete numerical analysis, uh, essentially numerical relativity using our models. One of the big payoffs there is can we find places where we can build a gravitational microscope? Can we find places, for example, black holes with maxima with critical rotation rates, things like that. Can we find places where somehow we see through to the discrete structure of space, where some kind of uh, shock noise and gravitational waves or some such other thing em emanating from some uh, you know, rapidly rotating black hole or some such other thing allows us to actually see, no, it's not continuum all the way down, allows us to actually build a microscope that allows us to see to the atoms of space. And so that's something that is kind of in motion, trying to figure out um, how one does those kinds of things. Also trying to understand the early universe and understand whether, for example, dimension fluctuations in our, in our kind of models, what we roughly expect is that the universe started infinite dimensional and gradually as the universe expanded and sort of cooled in a sense, it became more finite, more finite dimensional eventually, very close to three dimensional. And, um, three dimensions of space at least. And, and so one of the questions is, one of the frontier questions is, can we make a, a, a model 
of the early universe, the sort of a standard model, the, the Freeman Roberts Walker model of an expanding universe that's a homogeneous isotropic universe. And the question is, but with a fixed dimension, the question is, can we make a dimension changing generalization of that that might be a good first approximation model for the very early universe? And if we do that, what will that tell us about dimension fluctuations that might have been left behind and might even be visible in, for example, the structure of the cosmic microwave background? And so that's another kind of frontier thing is can we, can we detect dimension fluctuations in the early universe, 100,000 years, you know, where we get to see back to the, the last, last scattering surface from photons that, that began in the early universe? Um, you know, can we, can we detect those kinds of things? That would be a very exciting realization that actually our universe isn't or wasn't precisely three-dimensional, and that would be a really good piece of evidence for, for the kinds of models that we have. But anyway, so the, there's a bunch of things going on in the space-time story. Uh, one of the connections we made a bunch is to causal set theory. Causal set theory basically just is talking about the events that happen in space-time and saying, imagine you have a bunch of events thrown down in space-time, and then all you get to say is what their causal connections are. One of the things that's really nice is that what our models do is they provide an algorithmic way to generate those events, and they give one a, 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 a sort of distribution of those events that have certain physically nice properties, like a satisfying relativity and so on, which have not been clear how those come out in, in just throw it down randomly kind of causal set theory. There's also causal dynamical triangulations, which are a different model in which one is taking essentially a triangulation of space um, that is, uh, as opposed to taking just the points that correspond to the events, one's triangulating space. And again, a bunch of work's been going on to understand how causal dynamical triangulations relate to our models. Um, and it's, the relation is very nice, very clean, I think it will be helpful on both sides. Okay, so that's that's a little bit on space-time, the structure of space-time and general relativity. Another big piece of the traditional story of physics is quantum mechanics. The sort of very foundational point about our models is that the sort of distinction between classical physics and quantum physics is, is always that in classical physics, definite things happen. You drop a stone, it moves in a certain trajectory. In quantum mechanics, there are a, a whole collection of possible trajectories and we get to just sample some uh, probability of different outcomes. Well, in our models, that there are many possible histories of the universe is something absolutely burnt in. It's absolutely inevitable. It comes because of these multiple threads of time that I keep on mentioning of all these different paths in this multi-way graph. So that's kind of a, a um, uh, that's, that's why where quantum mechanics comes from. Now the question is, well, what about all the effects of quantum mechanics? How do we understand the structure of quantum mechanics? Well, it turns out that our multi-way graphs immediately give you the mathematical structure of what is underlying quantum mechanics. And we can see that through categorical quantum me uh, mechanics, uh, a formulation of quantum mechanics using category theory. Um, we can see that in, in which we're looking at some, uh, well, we, we can see that in a variety of ways. But the bottom line is that in terms of the mathematical formulation of quantum mechanics, it is identically equivalent to the structure of our multi-way graphs. And even so equivalent that, for example, we are about to release a quantum framework for Waltham language, some part of that quantum framework compiles quantum circuits to multi-way graphs. Because it turns out that various manipulations, particularly related to automated theorem proving, are much easier to do in the formulation with multi-way graphs than they would be with traditional kind of uh, uh, standard mathematical structures that one might use for quantum mechanics. So we're kind of knowing in this sort of proof by compilation way that what we have is equivalent to the mathematical structure of quantum mechanics. Um, and uh, that's, so that's one thing. Another, one of the big features of quantum mechanics is, okay, there are all these quantum processes happening and there's a mathematical description in terms of quantum amplitudes and so on, but then we observe the quantum world and we then conclude that there are certain probabilities of different things happening. How does that work in these models? So the question is, what does the observer, how does the observer observe things in quantum mechanics? So one thing to say is that the, we have, Quantum mechanics is, is a story of all these different threads of history, all these different paths. And the question is, we can imagine a space 
We call it branchial space, the space of quantum branches. We can imagine a space that is where all these paths of history are laid out. Just like we can imagine all these events happening in ordinary space time, they're happening in different places. We can say they're laid out in different places in space because we can, we can sort of uh, untangle this chain of events that happened and say, this is a reasonable layout to use to describe where these, where these events are in space. So similarly, when we look at these different threads of time, we can say, this is a potential layout of these different threads of time in branchial space, in the space of quantum branches. And that's a, um, and we can say, how are these different threads of time related? They are entangled. They're entangled because they have common ancestors. Two threads may have come from a common ancestor. And so we can kind of use that to lay out this kind of branchial space of the relations between these different threads of time. So that branchial space is the space in which quantum mechanics plays out. And in a sense, the description of quantum mechanics is a story of things like motion in branchial space. And the, the, in fact, the, the very dynamics, the, the story of GD6 in physical space and, their, and the effect of energy on GD6 in physical space is played out exactly the same in branchial space. There are GD6 we can look at there and we can ask what is the effect of energy of activity in this multi-way graph? What are the, is the effect of that activity on these GD6? Well, it deflects them. Those deflections are the, the are what essentially is the, is the weighting that occurs in the Feynman path integral when you're trying to work out sort of quantum amplitudes, you're, you're the summing over all these different possible paths and you're giving a certain weighting. And that weighting is determined by the deflection of those paths in branchial space. So a, a critical piece of interpretation, which still we're still working to, to, to figure out in more detail is, okay, it seems that quantum phase the, when you have a quantum amplitude, it has a certain phase, it has a certain magnitude. Traditionally, it's just been, oh, it's a complex number, let's package those two things together. In our models, it's good to separate those apart and to say the quantum phase is determined by position in branchial space. The quantum uh, magnitude is determined by the number of paths that get you to that particular place in, in branchial space. But the coordinatization of branchial space is something we're still working on. That's a, that's a very difficult mathematical problem to understand these transversals of the, of the multi-way graph and understand how to coordinateize the transversals of the multi-way graph. But that's the thing that is that I think is, is sort of destined to give us, to show us how quantum phase works in these kinds of setups. So one of the questions is, okay, we've got all these things, all these GD6 in branchial space, and they're moving around. We have a certain density of, of GD6 that might be the result of some experiment in branchial space. But now the observer, that's us, has to say, well, what actually happened? And then remember that branchial space is all these different possible threads of history. You say, well, which one did we follow? Where are we in branchial space? Well, the answer is that we are also, like the rest of the universe, we are branching and merging and, and doing all those things that happen in the multi-way graph. We are merely a part of this multi-way graph. And so in a sense, the story of quantum mechanics is a story of how does a branching brain perceive a branching universe? How does this, this kind of, how does in this setup where there's all this branching happening in this multi-way graph, how does that get perceived by us as observers who are also undergoing those kinds of branching processes and, and so on. And actually one of the early insights in our project due to Jonathan Gorard had to do with sort of, uh, I, I mean, my under, the understanding of this now is a little different than at least my understanding of what Jonathan originally was talking about. Although it probably in, in Jonathan's mind, it might actually be exactly the same thing. Um, but uh, the, the, um, the, the question is, the thing that we do, and it's all about sequentializing time. In fact, our brains are branching, the universe is branching. There's a big assumption we make. And the assumption we make is time can be sequentialized. And that means that even though we are experiencing all these different branches that are in some sense happening, we, when we try to describe what's going on, we say, let's conflate all these branches together. For our purposes, we're going to just say, we're going to assume that all those branches are the same. We're going to make, in the, in the language of automated theorem proving, a completion that 
causes us to think those branches are treated the same. I should maybe explain that comment about automated theorem proving. These multi-way graphs, they're very general kinds of things. And one place where they show up is in, if you have a mathematical expression and you have a certain axiom that says how that expression can be transformed into another expression, you can say, well, there are many different ways that expression could be transformed. If you're trying to prove a theorem that says this expression is equal to this expression, what you're trying to do is in that whole network of possible transformations, you're trying to find a path that goes from your first expression to your second expression. That's kind of like trying to find, it might not be, well, there's a shortest proof, which is the geodesic path from one expression to the other. But this question of, of how um, uh, the, the um, the sort of the structure of a multi-way graph is also the structure of the set of all possible theorems that can be proved by applying these axioms to these different expressions. We'll maybe come back to that a little bit later. I could talk about my thinking about metamathematics um, uh, in, a, in a little bit. But um, the, the, in any case, the, this idea that the story of quantum measurement is a story of us as observers conflating these different branches to be the same and that's why we conclude that definite things happen in the universe. Now, the question is, okay, it's all very good. We might say, well, we assume something definite happens in the universe, but maybe we're just wrong. Maybe that is not a consistent assumption. Well, it turns out there's this phenomenon we call causal invariance that we think is a feature of these underlying transformation rules, although it's actually a feature that probably generically emerges for reasons that I can explain. But causal invariance means that it doesn't ultimately matter which conflation, which, which that, that all of those different paths of history will in some sense ult ultimately converge. It might take some astronomically long time, but by making this definite assumption about what happened in the universe, one's never going to be wrong. It's always going to turn out that that was an okay assumption to make. Now, as a practical matter, sort of knitting together making those assumptions. What is the process by which those assumptions get made? How does our brain kind of uh, co come to the conclusion? How does it sort of reduce these, these, all these multi-way branches? How does it do that conflation? That is something that is beyond the description of ordinary quantum mechanics. That's something which in, tradi in the traditional formulation of quantum mechanics, one thinks about that as, a, uh, as something that is just, oh, it's just this mathematical thing that measurement occurs, you have the Born rule and things that says, you just take the quantum amplitude and take the square of it and that's the probability. But the dynamics of how that works is not really described. In our models, we start to be able to talk about the dynamics of how that works. And that is, is something, so, so that story of the dynamics of how that works is, begins with the question of what are we like in branchial space? In physical space, we know our brains have a certain size, they perceive a certain set of things. They, you know, we kind of know we've got this region of physical space that we're sensitive to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What is the corresponding story in branchial space? What is our perception of branchial space? Even how big are we in branchial space? In physical space, you know, in round numbers of sort of physicist estimation, we're about a meter, uh, you know, across in physical space in some sense. Um, you know, how big are we in branchial space? We don't really know. Uh, but that's a question that, and that, that size in branchial space, that's the kind of coarse graining scale in branchial space that we're applying. And that's how we relate to sort of quantum measurement and so on. Now, I think what will be the case is that most of what we observe in branchial space is coarse grained. It's just like the molecular dynamics in fluids and things. We don't look at most of the time, we're not sensitive to the motion of individual molecules we're instead only sensitive to this coarse grain collective motion. I think the same thing is what's going on in branchial space, that in branchial space, we're also mostly just sensitive to the overall flow in branchial space, so to speak, not the detailed pattern of this branch went this way and that branch went that way. In a sense, when we observe quantum effects, we are seeing through to the molecular dynamics level, which is effectively the individual branches in branchial space as opposed to merely seeing the coarse grained sort of branchial sampling of branchial space. So it, it's kind of like uh, in, in gas dynamics, for example, we might see Brownian motion. That's an effect where we see through to, you know, we see that pollen grain being kicked around individually by the molecules in, in the gas. 
Uh, we might also, if we're doing hypersonic flow, we might see something where the gas is flowing sufficiently rapidly, the shock fronts are thin enough that we're sensitive to the details of how the gas works inside. Those are things where there's a question in the kind of branchial analog of this, what are those things in which we actually see quantum effects? Are there going to be potentially places where even on a large scale, we see quantum effects? And that's, that's something of, of uh, we're trying to figure out. Um, we're trying to figure out one of the things that is a consequence of our models is that just as there's a maximum speed of light in physical space, you have an event here, there's a whole light cone of, of, of events that can be affected by that event. But the, the events that can be affected, it only, with respect, if we uh, map them onto physical space, they only, the, the sort of the front of events that can be affected moves outward only at the speed of light. Similarly, in branchial space, there is an entanglement cone. And once an event has happened in branchial space, there is only a certain cone in branchial space that can be affected by that event. Can we detect the maximum entanglement speed? Might there be an effect that is in many body quantum mechanics that involves essentially a large number of degrees of freedom in a quantum system in which we can see, oh, we only got to this number of degrees of freedom, we didn't get further. By the way, things like the time dilation happens in quantum mechanics, it's a, the quantum Zeno effect. It's sort of a mysterious thing. So here, here's, a, here's a weird thing. So when a quantum measurement happens, it's as if you're stopping time. It's as if you, you no longer, you're, you're saying quantum measurement is like saying there is a definite quantum observation that happens. And you say, this is how things came out. We're no longer letting these different threads of time progress. We're just saying, this is the result. So there's a question about sort of how often are you getting definite results? And in, in many quantum experiments, you kind of say, well, we're going to, we're going to, you know, sort of tell, we're going to sort of extrude things to the point where there is a, a very long running, you know, we didn't get a definite result type thing. And that's what we call a quantum effect. In chemistry, for example, you might have a picture of a molecule and the picture of the molecule has atoms in definite places. How can that be? These atoms are quantum mechanical things. How can they be in definite places in any real sense? Well, the notion is that the environment of the molecule is effectively doing continuous measurement on the molecule. And that's why you can say in a reasonable way, these atoms are in definite places. But understanding that process of continuous measurement and understanding kind of the rate of continuous measurement and how that changes in different situations, that is going to give one something that's the analog of time dilation in quantum mechanics and might end up being an observable effect. So in any case, that, that's some, um, uh, the, so, so there's this question of how big are we in branchial space? What are the dynamics and what are the collective dynamics in branchial space? For example, are there black holes in branchial space? It's possible that one way in which we could definitely have a definite conclusion about what happened in the universe is if all our GD6 in branchial space all converge, if there's enough energy in branchial space that enough activity in branchial, uh, in, uh, that in, across branchial space that, that all these different paths of history converge, that's a definite way in which we could have a kind of a collapse of the wave packet in the language of quantum mechanics, just by the dynamics of, um, uh, of how this works. And I have to say, I, I, um, uh, Roger Penrose has been talking about kind of um, uh, various kinds of quantum gravity ways of, of, of having things measured in quantum mechanics. And I've always thought they were, they were kind of crazy. And I'm now realizing that actually, at least in that interpretation, which I don't know is equivalent to what he's talking about, there is a sense in which his very singularity theorems that apply to space time might also apply in branch hill space and might have a really interesting consequence there about the kind of the structure of branch hill space and the possibility that there is, that there are things like black holes in branch hill space. But um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure that that's necessary for quantum measurement to have the definitive black hole where you have this, the, you know, the, the, the analog of the computational answer. But I think that might be sort of the extreme version of, of how you can understand how measurement has to be able to happen. But this question about the process of measurement is important if one's trying to understand quantum computing, for example. It's important to understand what is the kind of budget of, uh, in terms of time or energy to achieve a measurement, we don't know completely. It's still something we're working on. We're getting closer on that. You know, is there really 
a, 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 you know, can one really get mileage out of quantum computing? But I've been interested in looking at the actual physical instantiations of quantum computers to try to understand how we map the actual physical instantiations onto our kinds of models to try and understand more about the dynamics of that measurement process. Well, so another thing to say is that this whole story of multi-way graphs, the multi-way graph, one version of the multi-way graph is that every state, every node of the multi-way graph is a complete state of the universe. And then the, this question is, why do the, or why are there mergers in the multi-way graph? Well, it's because we get to states of the universe which are indistinguishable. Indistinguishable to what? Indistinguishable to us as observers. In some sense, looking from the outside, it might be there's just a tree of all these possible states of the universe. But as observers embedded within that treeing process, we say, no, 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 it's not a tree. There are pieces that are identical. We can conflate them. We treat them as the same. So we're the, we're the sort of equivalence makers in that whole setup. And it's a big story of what's going on in multi-way graphs, in space-time, in the causal graph. It's all these equivalencing of things. That's an observer-generated thing. The equivalencing of things is the responsibility of observers. That's what observers do when they're computationally bounded, is they equivalence things together. Now, the question is, can we make a theory of how those equivalencings work? That theory is equivalent to a theory about how evaluation fronts work in distributed computing. It's basically the question of, well, there, there are different levels of equivalencing that you're interested in doing. But one important level of equivalencing is there are all these events that might happen. What is the foliation? What is the series of events that we consider to be happening at successive moments in time? And there's a question, how do you parameterize those things? And for example, when you, if you're on a tree, let's say, or even a graph, you might talk about depth first search. It's a standard computational kind of thing. You just recurse down sort of one side and then you get to the bottom and then you come back up and you recurse progressively like that. That's one form of, of evaluation, uh, sort of, uh, that, that's one way of parsing the different events that happen in, in space time effectively or in branch time. Um, another way you can do it is breadth first search where you say, I'm gonna look at all the events that are at this level of the tree, then this level, then this level. That's a little bit closer to the way that we normally parse events in space time. We normally say it's these events across space at a moment in time. So we're normally doing something closer to breadth first search. We could, you know, the alien observer of the universe could be doing depth first search. They could be parsing the universe by seeing the events in the infinitely distant future in, in, um, in one sort of path in, uh, uh, in one place in space into the infinite future and then going back and looking at other places in space. That's a different strategy. But so one of the challenges, one of the things we're, we're really interested in is this parameterization of different possible foliations, different possible ways to, to parse the structure of, of, of time and so on. And that particular uh, uh, question is one that really is, is maps directly into questions about distributed computing. It's really the question, for example, in Wolfram language, the way that we do things is we have these transformations among symbolic expressions, and we're always effectively just doing the first transformation that applies. And we keep doing that until we reach kind of the singularity in, in, in time, until we reach this moment where time has stopped, where no transformation applies. But if we imagine not just one possible path, but we imagine the whole multi-way graph of possible paths, that's, there are different styles of computing like logic programming, like automated theorem proving and so on, which effectively are, well, they are imagining all those possible paths, although they just pick out one path. Probabilistic programming, for example, imagines all the possible paths and says, what's the probabilities for different, different kinds of paths? But there is a generalization, I think, of all these things, which is this whole multi-computation story of, of how kind of how one looks at sort of the, how one makes for a human observer, so to speak, something out of this whole sort of multi-computational process. And I think that's, that's kind of a frontier as far as I'm concerned in thinking about computation. It's also a frontier in thinking about physics. And, um, the, uh, um, and, and that's, that's kind of the, the, the story of that. Look, there are two other things. I know this was billed as a Q&A and I've been yakking for a long time here. Um, the, uh, 
there are, I suppose, two other things that perhaps are worth talking about. Um, one is multi-computation, and the other is the approach to this thing I'm calling the Rouliad. Um, uh, okay, let's talk a little bit about multi-computation. So this idea of multiple threads of time, different events that can happen in different places, that's a general kind of model. It is very elegantly instantiated on hypergraphs. You could have the same kind of thing happening on strings, on trees, on lots of kinds of data structures. It happens to be particularly clean on hypergraphs. Oh, I, I should have said another thing, which is one of the challenges is, I mentioned one form of multi-way graph is the complete state of the universe goes into another complete state of the universe. That's a deeply inefficient way to represent the progress of time because most of the universe is identical between these two different, di different states of the universe. And so one thing we've been working on is local multi-way graphs and essentially breaking down multi-way graphs into their uh, underlying um, the uh, um, uh, you know, uh, underlying sort of elements to understand what really is at the, the essence of this kind of process of, of this kind of multi-way evolution of the universe. And, and, and how do we kind of share, there, there might be a piece of space in one state of the universe that's exactly the same as a piece of state in another, uh, in another state of the universe. And why do we need to evolve those separately? How do we make this sort of in, enmeshed version of evolving both in branches and in space together. And, and so, for example, one of the things I looked at a bit is multi-space, this idea of having a, a version which is where you're mostly looking at space, but in a particular place in space, there's this kind of stack of different multi-way branches. You're kind of having branchial space in one direction, physical space in the other direction. I might say that one of the things that's been popular in mathematical physics the holography principles, ADF, CFT correspondence, and so on, we're pretty sure, and we're getting increasing evidence that those are precisely the correspondence between physical space and branchial space. That the ADS story, anti Tessitta space, is a, a general relativity story that's a story of physical space, and CFT, conformal field theory, is a story of branchial space. And the fact that those two things knit together is a consequence in our models of the fact that there's this single multi way causal graph. Which uh, whose projections are one and one way are physical space and in another way are branchial space, um, and that's that seems to be how that works. Um, so that that's a sort of very concrete instantiation of this correspondence between the gravitational and the quantum. But so one of the challenges is how do we break down multiway graphs, particularly multiway graphs for hypergraphs into the right elements so that we're sort of doing only the computation we need to do. So one thing we've looked at a bunch are token event graphs, where essentially what you do is instead of thinking about the whole state of the universe, which is in the, in the case of a hypergraph is the state of the universe is 10 to the 400 hyper edges, let's say, all connected together because they share different atoms of space and so on. All those hyper edges, a big bucket of hyper edges is the state of the universe. And we could say, let's take that whole big bucket and consider its evolution. Or we could say, let's take individual hyper edges as sort of tokens that are the thing from which the evolution is going to be made and look at tokens ingested in events producing other tokens. That's a token event graph. Now, what happens is at some fundamental level, you might say that's what's really going on. We've just got a bunch of tokens in the universe, a bunch of these hyper edges and they are getting ingested in these events and producing other hyper edges and so on. The problem with that point of view is, great, that's how it works when you implement it on the computer, let's say, but how do we perceive that? We don't perceive all these hyper edges in these different, you know, the, the essentially different branches of time, different hyper edges in these different branches of time, but we conflate a lot of that stuff together. What we're doing is it's another story of equivalencing. We're taking a whole bucket of hyper edges and saying that's a state of the universe. And in a sense, that's an inefficient thing to do because multiple states of the universe will share many hyper edges. But we can sort of atomize that down to these, these token event graphs, but then we don't see the big picture. And so there's this trade-off between sort of the token event graph level and the, the, uh, the, the, the kind of whole uh, sort of states of the universe level. 
And that's a that's a whole the interplay between those things is an important thing. It's an interplay that directly plays into sort of quantum gravity. It is the story of quantum gravity, that interplay between what happens at the token event graph level, which is a quantum mechanics story, and how those 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 tokens get knitted together. That's a space-time story. And that correspondence is the formation of essentially quantum gravity. And so this whole question about how multi-ray graphs, token event graphs, how that all works, getting intuition about, about, uh, about multi-ray graphs and so on. I've done some work recently on looking at multi-ray graphs that just involve numbers. We just say, have a number X. And at every step, I replace X by 2X plus 1 or 3X plus 1. That makes a whole multi-ray graph. It's a pretty complicated one. You can ask questions about what will happen in that multi-ray graph. There are all kinds of very difficult computational questions you can ask, but you're trying to understand how does that kind of thing, that sort of a, a way of understanding a multi-ray graph. Another one I've looked at is, is games, like tic-tac-toe. There are different moves you can make in tic-tac-toe. Each different state of the tic-tac-toe board is a, a, a possible sort of state of the universe. And this whole game graph of, of what can happen to tic-tac-toe, that's a multi-ray graph at the level of states of the universe. And, and you can ask questions about, in branchial space, that's all the possible game states that can exist at a particular moment in time in the game. And you can do this whole token event graph thing for, for things like tic-tac-toe, where you take the disembodied move and you say, how do those get knitted together into complete states and so on? You can see all these kinds of things happen there. Um, you know, for me, there's a gradual increase of understanding as I try more and more examples of, of, this, of this whole process. But the core idea that of multi-computation, that there are all these events that happen, and we as observers are knitting these things together by certain kinds of equivalences, that's a, a sort of foundational idea. And there are many different domains in which you can imagine making a model in which there are just different events happening that ingest tokens of various different kinds. And, uh, and then we get to observe them in some way. So I think there are, there are just a whole bunch of these areas. Metamathematics is one area. Let me not talk about that perhaps here. That's a, that's its whole long discussion on its own. Um, I'll just say one or two things about that. I mean, in, in metamathematics, the, the tokens are essentially mathematical propositions. And the, uh, the events have to do with how do different mathematical propositions entail other propositions? So a typical thing might be in mathematical logic, modus ponens, P implies Q, given P, you can deduce Q. That's essentially saying you've got two mathematical propositions, your entailment event grinds them up and produces one conclusion from that. So a sense, in a sense, it's a token event graph with two tokens, ground up, they make one token. So you can, you can ask, how does this whole structure of all these different sort of mathematical propositions, how does that get, how do they entail each other? And, and that uh, essentially what I'm, what I'm working towards is a kind of bulk theory of metamathematics. And I'm trying to understand the extent to which the sort of low level axiomatic theory of mathematics relates to the kind of mathematics that human mathematicians perceive. It's again, a story of how do these microscopic sort of molecular level mathematics that might be done by an automated theorem proving system, how do those relate to the kind of human scale? This is the concept in mathematics that we're talking about. And part of the point there is that, the, oh, I, I should have said a very important feature is if the observers have features like computational boundedness and time sequentialization, and the underlying system is this kind of multi-computational system where all these events are happening, then it is inevitably the case that you have phenomena like general relativity, that you have the detailed mathematics of things like Einstein's equations and so on. Now, how they are interpreted, well, that depends on what the observer is actually observing, what, how the observer thinks about what they're observing. Are they observing you know, quantum phases? Are they observing positions in space? Are they observing something about the structure of mathematics? You know, what are they observing? Those are the things that interpretation is what determines how that works. But the thing that one's realizing is that it's, it's a very interesting situation where there is from a very basic assumptions about a model and basic assumptions about the observer of that model, then there are inevitable physics-like laws that apply. And that's a 
pretty important kind of thing because there are many fields of science where people have hoped for physics like laws, let's take economics, linguistics, any of these areas, bio biological evolution. People have hoped for physics like laws for a long time. They've never been able to find them. And it's always seemed that, that, that but what this is telling one is actually there probably are physics like laws. They may be, however, about things that aren't what we're currently observing or thinking about observing or aren't things that are natural for us humans to observe. And that will be sort of bad luck or well, they might turn out to be about things that we humans can observe, and we might then have a physics-like law in something like economics. I, I, I will say that I, I wrote a thing uh, recently about um, uh, the, um, the kind of, um, this, this notion of multi-computation as a paradigm for making models. Uh, maybe I can just say a few things about that. That this kind of, I, I see it as being sort of a fourth paradigm for making models of things. Uh, you know, back in antiquity, the big story was, how do you take the thing you see in the world and break it down into pieces and just say, what is the structure of the thing? You don't worry about time. You just say, is it made of atoms? Does it, is it made of epicycles? What's it made of? Then 1600s, the big innovation was, think about mathematical equations. You describe things in terms of equations and formulas, and you say, this formula describes what's going to happen in the system. Time just becomes a coordinate, a variable in that formula, and you get to sort of select the time you want. Then 1980s, kind of uh, uh, something that I guess I was deeply involved in is kind of this idea of treat computation as a fundamental paradigm for making models of things. Then what you say is I've got this rule, now to see what happens in the system, just run this rule and see what it does. So time is much more explicit than that. It's not a variable where you just dial the value. It's something where to know what happens after a certain amount of time, you have to just go through and run the rule. And there's this phenomenon of computational irreducibility that tells you you can't jump ahead in doing that process. So that's a case where time is something real, but it's one dimensional. It's a progression of apply this rule, this rule, this rule. The thing now is this idea of multi-computation where you are also apply this rule, apply this rule, but there are multiple paths by which that rule can be applied. There's this whole multi-way uh, evolution and the multiple threads of time. And one feature of that is that it means that the observer can no longer say, oh, I know what happened in the system. I just sampled it. Because the observer, to be able to sample the system, the observer has to have some way to make equivalences between these different threads of time. And so the observer is a necessary piece but once you have an observer with certain characteristics, it is necessarily the case that you end up with certain physics-like features of that model. And so then the question becomes, what is the chemical observer like? What is the observer for the immune system like? And are these things, things that relate to kind of human aspects of those systems that we care about? But so that's, that's one important, so, so to me, it's really an incredibly surprising thing because I thought the applications of our physics project would be a century or two at least away. That you know we're not going to have the the faster than light travel thing made possible by you know knitting through the structure of space or something like that. That's a really long time in the future. But it's turning out that this analogy, and more than an analogy, this formal correspondence between physics and these other areas is delivering what I think will be very near term applications in a lot of different areas, and I, I consider that a very exciting thing. All right, final thing I wanted to talk about was this notion of the Rouliad. So one of the mysteries in our model of physics is why this universe and not another? And why one particular set of rules and not another one? Well, when we talk about multi-way systems, we're talking about apply this set of rules in all possible ways. But let's go even one step further. Let's say beyond that, let's say, let's apply all possible rules. At every step, just apply every rule that could apply, every conceivable rule that could apply, apply all of them or any of them. Each one is a different thread of time. You say, how could that make anything reasonable? That's just gonna be a total mess. You're gonna be able to get from anywhere to anywhere by applying these rules. Well, that's true, but there's a very important sort of footnote to that, which is it's all deeply entangled. That is these two rules that might be going, that the, these two rules, when you start them with two initial conditions, because of this equivalencing process, those two rules might wind up in the same state. 
So you, instead of get, just getting this thing where everything's connected to everything, everything's connected to things, but in this way that is a very complicated entangled kind of graph that shows you that this can lead to that, but then this is the same as what comes from that and so on. You get this whole entangled structure. That entangled structure, the limit of that entangled structure, as you look at all possible rules, with all possible initial conditions, you don't really need to consider the initial conditions separately because you can just have a rule that goes from nothing to the thing that is the initial condition. When you consider that whole thing, when you consider that whole object that is made from following all possible rules in all possible ways, one of the things about that object is there are rules and they are applied and there is a computation that happens every time those rules are applied. You're getting a giant token event graph, a giant multi-way graph, that represents the effect of all possible rules applied in all these possible entangled ways. Okay, that's a very complicated abstract object that you get out. But that object in some sense is the description of all possible physical realities. It's a description of all possible formal systems. It is the entangled description of all possible formal systems. And one of the things that's interesting that I was looking at is when you wonder why does the universe exist? Well, the, the fact that all possible formal systems exist, that's a necessary self-evident thing. A formal system is just something that you can write down. It doesn't, it is just a thing that is necessarily something that works the way it works. And um, I think that the, the thing that, um, what, what, what one's interested in is, so you've got this kind of, this object that is made from, all these possible formal systems entangled in all these ways that they're entangled because of the equivalencing of things where, where those different formal systems may make the same thing. And so that knits them all together and it knits together the structure of this object. What is that limiting object? I recently came up with a name that I rather like for it. I call it the Ruliad. It's the, it's the infinite limit of the Rulial multi of all Rulial multiway systems. It is the infinite limit of all computational processes. Okay, and it, but it has a structure, a very definite structure. And that structure, it's not easy to, to pick at that structure. We can, we can sort of approximate the structure in a variety of ways. I studied it for multi-way Turing machines. I've studied it a bit for multi-way string systems. I'm gonna study it for other kinds of cases. We can just sort of pick at that structure, but in the end, we can imagine this kind of mathematical structure in effect that is this ultimate limit of the application of all possible rules in these entangled ways. And that object necessarily exists. Now the question is, what's the relation of that object to our universe? Well, maybe that object is our universe, but we only perceive certain slices of the Ruliad. We are not, the whole Ruliad is essentially all possible necessarily uh, necessary formal things. But what we are doing is we are observers of the Ruliad and we get to see it from a certain point of view. It's similar to physical space. We exist, we're a big universe, 10 to the 26 meters across, whatever it is. And here we are one meter across each of us. And we are roughly in physics terms. Um, and, we, uh, and we are at a particular place in the universe we get to, well, with telescopes, we can sample some other parts of the universe, but fundamentally we exist at a particular place in physical space. And we are familiar with the universe around our place in physical space. Interesting question, where are we in branchial space? And how far away do we see in branchial space? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think that will tell us a lot about how quantum mechanics works and the possibility of quantum computers and things like this. But that's, that's put that aside for a second. But what about Ruleal space? Where are we in Ruleal space? Well, we're sampling this particular slice of Ruleal space. We sample it based on the particular sensory apparatus that we have, our particular features of computational boundedness, sequentialization in time, and so on. But we could be sampling the Ruleal in very different ways. There are, we have a certain way of sampling the Ruleal. And that way of sampling in Ruleal space, we are at a particular place in Ruleal space that is determined not just by our sensory apparatus, but by the things that we care about and that we've built up in our mathematics and in our science and so on. We could imagine an utterly different 
place in the Ruliad. We can imagine utterly different position in Rulial space from which we would have a completely different view about how the universe works. And I've realized that in, in kind of um, philosophy and so on, people think about, you know, are there very different sort of ways of thinking about the world? Maybe not through the lens of modern Western science or something, maybe in some other way. And what this is giving one, it's, you know, the, the lens of modern Western science has built up this giant tower of capability much, much bigger, I think, than, than probably other towers, at least at the level of, of formal structure. But the, you know, what this is telling one is there might be completely different ways to view the same rulial universe in which we are living. And so when it comes to, you know, where are the aliens, so to speak, well, they may be in a different place in physical space in another star system, you know, 10 light years away, but they may also be in a different place in rulial space. They may be right here in physical space, but in a different place in rural space. And that's a question. And the question then is, how do we make that translation? So in a sense, that story of translations in rural space is about motion in rural space. What is motion like in rural space? What does it even mean? Well, motion in rural space is the translation from one set of rules to another. It's a thing that in computation theory, we're quite familiar with a universal computer one universal computer can emulate another universal computer by essentially running an interpreter for the first universal computer within the second one. That's, that's how, but that interpretation process might take a certain more cycles of one computer than, than to do the interpretation to figure out what the other computer is, is how the other computer will act. But that's this process of translation, of, of, of translate, computational translation is the that's, that's what it means to essentially move in rural space is that one's saying one is, one is progressively doing translation to a different, a, a different description of the universe. And there is, by the way, just like there's a speed of light, there's a maximum entanglement speed, there's a maximum speed of rural motion. Within the universe, there's a maximum rate at which you can do that translation because the universe only computes at a certain rate. And so that translation can only happen at a certain rate. And so one can start thinking about what are the analogs of all these different phenomena in rural space. But I think the thing that's most significant there is kind of the, the, this, this thinking about this ruliad, this, this kind of limiting formal object. And what can we say about that limiting formal object? Well, one place is it, 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 it sort of converges with an upper limit of mathematics. It converges with thinking about higher category theory and particularly the things that uh, Alexander Grothendieck thought about, and, and this kind of, um, uh, this, this idea of infinity categories. But roughly what happens is, you can think about categories in terms of objects and morphisms, a little bit like graphs, and you can think about, uh, in mathematics, you could think about, you know, there's a, there's a proposition and there's, a, there's a, 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 um, a transformation that leads to another proposition, and, and, that, and that sequence of transformations is like a proof and you can ask questions like, what about proof to proof transformations? Instead of proposition to proposition transformations, proof to proof transformations. That's essentially building up a higher category. And it's the same kind of thing in, in our models of, um, of, of space time. That kind of uh, the analog of proof to proof transformations has to do with, with foliations and the equivalencing in foliations going from one uh, 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 sort of causal path to another one. But in any case, as you take the limit, of proposition to proposition that makes a proof, proof to proof transformations, proof to proof to proof transformations. You keep going, you take the limit of all those things, you get to this thing, the infinity category, the infinity groupoid, which is this object that has been studied a little bit that has certain properties. One property that Grothendieck conjectured about it, which I think is, is, is we can kind of intuitively see why this is the case, is that in that object, in that limiting object, there is inevitably geometry there is inevitably some sense of space, some sense of sort of things being near things and some way in which you can sort of lay it out in some sort of spatial geometric way. And in a sense, the idea is that this Ruliad is this infinite limit of all these applications of all these possible rules. And one of the features of it may be that it has an inevitable geometric structure. And the fact that it has an inevitable geometric structure then trickles down to things like the fact that we can think of physical space as having a geometrical structure. It also implies that things like branchial space will have a geometrical structure, and that's a thing to still be worked out. But in any case, that, that's a, um, so this, this kind of Rouliad idea 
is something which becomes the infinite limit both of physics and of mathematics. And so there are a bunch of things one could think about about interpretations of mathematics and what mathematics really is. But since I said I would talk about physics here, let me not get too deep into that. Uh, people can ask about it if you're interested. But in any case, the, the thing that um, sort of the picture in terms of physics is, is this. You say, what are the rules for the universe? Well, the rule, universe follows all possible rules. Okay, why does that tell you anything? Well, it tells you something because we are observers of a certain kind in the universe. And so we are, we are sampling those rules in a certain way. It turns out there's a considerable degree of universality in what we sample independent of those underlying rules, just like in the dynamics of gases or something, the details of the underlying molecules don't matter much when you're looking at fluid dynamics. It doesn't, you know, it affects the viscosity and things, but it doesn't affect the laws of fluid motion, what the, what the details of the molecules actually are. And so similarly here, there are features like general relativity, which are generic across many different possible uh, places in real space, so to speak, many different possible attributions of rules to the universe. But the idea is the thing that's sort of emerging is this idea that, you know, what is the theory of physics? Well, in the end, the theory of physics says that it is this Rouliad object that follows all possible rules, and we are teasing out of it certain features that are associated with our way of observing, sampling the Rouliad, so to speak. And those are what give us our laws of physics. And to say we have figured out the fundamental theory of physics is more to say that we've managed to make this kind of language translation between what is formally possible and what we observe. And, and so in a sense, one, one's not saying, oh, here it is. I, you know, we, we may very well have a situation where we say, look, this is a rule. It's a simple rule. We can just run it and we will, with our appropriate interpretation, be able to see the things that we observe with our experiments and so on. But, but uh, in the end, it's not really a story of finding that individual rule. It's a story of finding this whole sort of translation between these different levels. Now, I, I think one of the things that I've sort of increasingly realized is that our view of physics is going to be determined by our time in history and the technology that we have and so on. In other words, what it is that we even think are worth describing as laws of physics are something that are quite dependent on our moments in history and our sort of development and uh, our, you know, they're things that one might have said, let's describe that there, there are sort of fine details, let's say in quantum mechanics, where we say, by golly, we've got experiments that actually see this stuff. So we want a description framework for those. But there are probably other things which in the future are potentially things that we could be sensing about the universe, which are effectively taking us to a slightly different place in real space. And those things that we could be sensing about the universe that we currently don't make use of in our everyday thinking and everyday action, we make use of certain things and modern science has given us other things that we can make use of that we couldn't make use of before about the universe. There are things that we can imagine making use of about in the universe. We don't yet know what they are, but those might be things very different from what we make use of today. They might be things which give us a very different experience of the universe and allow us to make vastly different technology, for example, vastly different kind of cognitive structures. And I don't know to what extent our particular kind of delivery from biological evolution has given us only this very specific you know, this very localized region of Rulial space, and to what extent, as we go to lots of effort, we can travel to other parts of Rulial space. I don't know how much effort that is. I don't know how far away it's like, you know, in the, the aliens, so to speak, how far away are they in physical space, you know, 10 light years, 100 light years, whatever, how far away are they in Rulial space? We don't know. We don't know how to measure those things. But, but this gives us a sort of framework, at least for thinking about these kinds of things. So in any case, that, that's some, um, so for, from a more, pragmatic point of view, I mean, I, I think the things that if we look at our physics project, the thing that I think is, is really exciting is that it's given us this kind of conceptual framework for thinking about just a ton of things that I at least have never had any framework for thinking about before. I've recently been sort of doing the project of going back and looking at the history of philosophy and trying to understand the extent to which things people have talked about, about human experience, the nature of the universe, the nature of time and so on, to what extent we can inform those discussions using what we now understand 
from our model of physics. And actually, it seems quite spectacular. I mean, it's a difficult problem from a sort of practical point of view because, you know, somebody, I don't know, Heidegger, Kant, any of these people, they wrote lots. It's hard to understand. You know, I, I don't know. I can only abstract a certain sort of, uh, uh, you know, having understood what I've understood from our physics project, I can then go and say, hey, that looks like a thing that I understand now. And so I, I'm, I'm going to try and make those correspondences. But that's a thing which is, is, is not, I can't claim that, uh, you know, these, that, that I can map the sort of precise words here onto, onto what we've done. But that's, you know, that, that sort of conceptual understanding is important. The implications for mathematics, uh, for both, well, these fundamental questions about foundations of mathematics, but also the practicalities of things like hyperfolds and the, the, the whole sort of infracalculus kind of concept of generalizing calculus and so on. These are all pieces that I think are pretty important. Um, I think that the, uh, the question of, um, uh, of understanding how multi-computation as a paradigm can be applied to all these different areas, I think that's really important. Really, a lot of things that are going to flow from that. Um, I think it's really a, 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 a just an amazingly sort of rich seam and, and one that I just didn't see coming at all. I mean, if you'd asked me, uh, you know, uh, two years ago, did I see this as a thing? I would have said, no, not at all. It's, it's right, really this thing that's arrived and now is, is, is extremely fertile. Uh, and so the, um, the thing now in terms of sort of the physics project, I would say that the, the biggest growth area there is making correspondences with other areas of mathematical physics. And there's a lot going on there. A lot of people working on that, interested in that. Uh, a lot of great things are coming out. Uh, I think we're going to see essentially most common areas of mathematical physics from st string theory to spin networks to all these kinds of things. I think we are going to see in hopefully the not too distant future, the precise correspondence is made to our models. I think what we're gonna see is essentially all of those mathematical physics ideas are essentially limiting cases, different kinds of limiting cases and slices of our kinds of models. We're like the machine code and these are like the high level descriptions of various kinds. And I think that will be very interesting and valuable both for our models and for these areas of mathematical physics. But so that's, that's one thing. I think one area that I would have to say has been dragging a bit is the experimental implications of our models. Uh, part of the reason that's been dragging is because there's, it's, it's, it's always a lot of work. You know, people say, oh, you know, just give an experimental implication. Well, that's, that's all well and good. Say, okay, great. What does it actually mean for, for dimension fluctuations in the early universe? That's a complicated calculation. It involves figuring out all these things about, about collective models of dimension change. It then involves all kinds of actual calculations in general relativity and in our models being applied to general relativity to figure out what does it actually mean for density spectra? When, when you figure that out, what does it mean for this, that, and the other, for the photons as they couple to that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's just a lot of work involved in doing that. Even the very basic thing of how do photons propagate through fractional dimensional space? We don't know the answer to that yet either. Um, but that's, in a sense, classical electrodynamics to figure that out. It's just a lot of work. And, and I have to say that, that for me personally, I've been kind of chasing these kind of implications and, and sort of foundational questions more than I've been chasing those kinds of experimental implications. Um, I, I, you know, I just don't know whether we're going to be lucky and whether it's going to be the case that we can say, here's an experiment. There are plenty of experimentalists who've been asking us, is there an experiment we can do? The answer is we don't know yet. But you know, it could be that there's an experiment that can be done in condensed matter physics in some quantum system, many body quantum system, where you can just do it. It's an easy desktop experiment. It could be. It could be that there are experiments that can be done with you know, satellites looking at uh, the cosmic microwave background. It could be that there are experiments that can be done by, by aggregating all kinds of information about gravitational wave events. We don't know yet. Um, and it could be that we'll be lucky and that that gravitational microscope will be findable by sort of a meta study of existing gravitational wave events, uh, 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 black hole mergers and so on. We don't know. Or it could be that we'll be off by 50 orders of magnitude. We just don't know. Um, and those are things that have to be worked out. And uh, if there's one area where I would love to see sort of more people recruited to this project, it's in the area of, of making these experimental correspondences and, and figuring out, you know, somebody is gonna figure out maybe one of these like, like just uh, sort of, amazing hit this amazing place where for whatever reason 
you get to see the Brownian motion of our models. It wasn't obvious when, when Mr. Brown you know, looked at pollen grains being kicked around and so on. It wasn't obvious that there would be any effect that would see through to the level of atoms that could be observed macroscopically through a microscope. It wasn't obvious that would be the case, but it turns out there is such an effect. Similarly, in quantum mechanics, there are plenty of effects where it wasn't obvious that there will be a way to see through the quantum level of things, but it turns out there is, and it involves some cleverness of inventing the right experiment. And that's an interesting thing to try to do. And uh, probably I haven't put as much effort as I should have done into that, but that's an area where we would like to see a lot more progress made. All right. The, um, okay, we have many questions here and I apologize for, for yakking on for too long. There's just an awful lot to talk about. Um, and I'm gonna go back and look at some of these questions and try and, um, uh, try and see if I can bucket them together a bit. Um, Okay, there's a question actually from yesterday, which we held over to today. Uh, are the rules that we're using um, uh, reversible? And could one run them backwards in time uh, uh, towards the Big Bang or beyond the Big Bang? Um, reversibility is a pretty complicated concept when it comes to these hypergraphs and so on. When you have a fixed number of degrees of freedom, it's pretty easy to say, this is a, an information conserving thing and this isn't. It's a bit more complicated in this case. Um, the, the typical rules that we're looking at aren't reversible and in the ruley out of all possible rules, many rules are not reversible, but they are effectively reversible in the same sense that a gas, when it goes to thermal equilibrium, behaves in an effectively reversible way even though it's, uh, that's a complicated thing. Even though the microscopic rules are reversible, but the macroscopic manifestation at the level of our coarse graining is not reversible, but yet in thermal equilibrium, the effective behavior is reversible. We get to see the same kind of effective reversible behavior. And that's why, for example, we observe unitarity in quantum mechanics and a bunch of other things that are sort of associated with reversibility. But, but the notion that you can just sort of turn the rules around and run them backwards, it isn't nearly as simple as that. It's a, it's a much more complicated story um, of, of uh, um, well, let's see, actually in a token event graph, you could run them backwards, but the reconstruction of space doesn't get to just run backwards. The observer imposed on that has a whole different set of issues. And actually it's an interesting question, the, the, how the, the imposition of the observer and the sampling by the observer relates directly to reversibility. That's an interesting question. I should think about that. I don't know. Um, let's see. Uh, our observers, Brady asks, our observers uh, fundamentally bound more by their ability to compute or their ability to make measurements? Another interesting question. I think those are ultimately the same thing because I think that the ability to compute is like, in these models where everything is computation, when you measure things, it is happening through events that are occurring, which are computations. Now, as a practical matter, when we look at technology today, our ability to, for example, see through to the atoms of space, is that limited by the technical, uh, by our, uh, is, that, is that limited by kind of the measuring devices we have, or is it limited by our ability to do data analysis on those measuring devices? That's a very subtle question. Let's imagine you're detecting a gravitational wave, okay? Well, there's some piece of, you know, does that weight move in just the right way? And have you managed to do sufficient isolation of the weight? Well, that's one way to think about it. Another way to think about it is, oh, I don't care whether I've done enough isolation, I'm gonna fix it all in data analysis. So you know, there's a trade-off between improve the, the, the raw physicality of the measurement and improve the data analysis. We see that trade-off all the time in telecommunications because it's you know, how well can we send that cell phone signal or that, um, that other kind of signal, the 5G signal through the world, so to speak. Well, actually there are all kinds of awkward objects that bounce radio waves and diffract them in different ways and so on and so on and so on, but we can fix it all in data analysis. So in a sense, you know, something like, I don't know, 5G or something is, is full of data analysis. It's a place where the trade-off between computation and measurement has been moved a bit. 
And so I think in the end, it's the same thing. I think in the end, there really isn't much difference. Now, as a practical matter, in terms of what the inventions are that allow us to go further, that may be something where we more see, oh, look, we just made this thing that allows us to, to make a you know, single atom recording of this or that. And that's a sort of physical thing rather than saying, oh, it's mostly about removing noise and the signal processing in the data analysis side of it. But those two things clearly are not, are not deeply separated. Uh, Peter is asking about biological evolution in our models. Let me get, not get too segued onto that, but, but in this multi-computation idea, I have a, a slight guess. We've thought about this a little bit. That, see, one of the things with biological evolution is there isn't really a good mathematical model of evolution beyond the level of certain aggregate things that relate to game theory and so on. But, but so one possibility is imagine that every thing that happens to every organism is associated with an event. And so we're looking not at the aggregate of all organisms of a particular species, but we're looking about every individual organism and everything that happens to every individual organism. And even if we go ruly along the whole thing, we're looking at every possible organism and every possible mutation that can happen at a genetic level to make every different possible organism. And so then the question that we ask is, well, what statements can we make about this kind of ruleal limit of biological evolution, or even just the, the kind of causal graph of effects of organisms on other organisms, individual organisms? What can we see? For example, could it be the case that there are event horizons that correspond to speciation? Could there be things which we observe in the kind of the, at the level of the biological observer, so to speak, the observer who's paying attention to what's happening with all these species that, that we can identify as being things that correspond to what we ex typically experience as physical observers. See, in the case of biology, you don't know where every nematode went, so to speak. That's just not something that's part of our observation process. What we do when we think about biological evolution is we think about, oh, do the nematodes turn into something else? So do, they, do the bacteria you know, evolve in this way? Do the viruses evolve in this way? We're not imagining that we're tracing every single you know, life event of every single virus. But what if we conceptually imagine doing that? What would we pick out of that? Would we pick out just the things we now pick out of here's the, the, the sort of evolutionary tree of viruses, or will we pick out different kinds of things? And I think that's the, that's the sort of approach to thinking about biological evolution. It's first go much deeper, much more granular, much more machine codey, and see if we can emerge from that something which may be a somewhat different way of mathematicizing effectively the theory of evolution. I don't know how that will work out. Uh, There's a question from Ryan about the uh, ruleology versus category theory. So ruleology, we've, we've, uh, I was talking about this yesterday, is kind of this idea of just studying simple rules and seeing what they do. When I talk about ruleal space, that's the space of possible rules. The ruleade is the collection of all possible rules. Ruleology is the individual study of one tiny corner, so to speak, of what does a particular rule do. How does all this stuff relate to category theory? It's pretty closely related. Um, I think that um, in the things we've been looking at in metamathematics, there is a really direct correspondence between objects and category theory and morphisms, the question of whether one describes things in terms of morphisms as objects, all kinds of things like this. I view category theory as being essentially a limiting description of some of the kinds of things we're talking about, a description which in a sense doesn't get as granular as it could. For example, in category theory, it's like there's just, you know, you always do the transitive closure. You always say you've got object morphism, object morphism, morphism, morphism. You follow all these morphisms, but then you say, actually, we could just, you know, we always have a morphism that goes from the original object to the final object. It's kind of like free. There's no cost. There's no computational cost to each morphism. But there's a more granular way of thinking about things in which there is a cost, in which you're doing essentially computational complexity bounded category theory. And I think things like that will be important here. I think also in our models, we're looking a lot at higher categories. We're not just looking at this kind of, um, uh, and by the way, I think that, okay, so there are things like um, functors that um, map between, um, you know, between morphisms and so on. And uh, one of the more bizarre statements will be 
that some, some aspects, okay, so here's a bizarre statement that I'm not gonna really justify. There's a question of what is the analog of spatial homogeneity in metamathematics? In the space of possible mathematical theories, what's the analog of saying that things are homogeneous? What's the sort of functorial, there's a sort of, is there a functor that takes you, that, that moves you around, that, 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 that is the analog of motion in, uh, in metamathematical space? And is the existence of such motion is the uniformity in metamathematical space a reason that in a sense there are these dualities between different kinds of mathematics? That's a, I, I have to leave that as a cliffhanger because I don't really understand it uh, properly yet, but hopefully soon. Um, okay, so Peter is asking about in a cellular automaton, when you have big white areas in the cellular automaton, are those examples of computational reducibility? Yes, they are. They're, they're places where, yes, you can jump a little bit ahead and uh, you can, any time when you can sort of compress the image by saying, oh, it's all white in that area, and you can imagine some compression process, that's an example of computational reducibility. The question is, what are the big kinds of computational reducibility? Like, oh, it's a periodic pattern. We can say what happens. Oh, it's this can, can be cracked by this kind of analysis. That's what that's all about. Uh, Okay, Aidan is asking, relativity requires causal invariance, quantum mechanics requires different threads of computation. The point is that the, th there are different threads in relativity. Those correspond to different reference, effectively thinking about things in terms of different reference frames. It's that there is a correspondence between those things produced by causal invariance that is what leads one to the equivalence of reference frames. In quantum mechanics, the analog of the equivalence of reference frames is the idea of objective reality in quantum mechanics. It could be the case that two observers, essentially with two different quantum observation frames, would just conclude the universe is different. There's no correspondence between the different views of those different observers. Causal invariance is the statement that eventually there will be a correspondence, there will be an objective reality which can be seen in common between those observers. I think, by the way, that a bunch of this kind of rulial space, positions in rulial space and so on, this begins to, to, to sort of eat into these questions about, about in philosophy, about different consciousnesses and how can you think, you know, we each exist as our own sort of consciousness that knows about ourselves, and yet we see these other consciousnesses and how do we make a correspondence from one to the other? And I think that's kind of a, a story of sort of going from one consciousness to another is not so much a story of moving physically to be, oh, I'm in the same room, I'm in the same space, but is a, 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 sort, a sort of a story of rulial motion. Can I get into that other mind? I think that's sort of the way to think about that kind of thing. And I think that this correspondence between uh, sort of objective reality has to do with some kind of uniformity in that space. At least that's my guess. Um, Let's see, Michael is asking about conservation laws, uh, know this theorem, those kinds of things. Yes, there is an analog of know this theorem. Yes, there are a bunch of symmetries and conservation laws. Um, the way those arise is you've got this hypergraph, it's being rewritten in all these different ways. Let's talk about rotational invariance, okay? You ask the question, given that you're at this position in the hypergraph, do all directions in the hypergraph look the same? Well, there's a definite hypergraph, it's doing what it's doing. But what you are asking is, in some average sense, do all directions look the same? And that's a question that you can absolutely ask. And you can absolutely ask, is there invariance under the rota a rotation, an analog of the rotation group? It's a weird analog of the rotation group because it's not in, 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 in an integer dimensional space. And we don't know what the rotation group is like away from integer dimensional space. That's mathematics that hasn't been developed yet. Um, but that's the thing that we're looking at, is that generalization of that. Now, when we look at, um, when we're looking at gauge invariance, I didn't talk about that here. That's a thing actively being looked at is the way that fiber bundles work. We, we can sort of start constructing all of standard differential geometry in this hyperfold type setting. And then what we've got is we can, we can think about fiber bundles and for in our world, the fibers in the fiber bundle that represent the gauge degrees of freedom and the base space that represents the spatial degrees of freedom, those are all made of the same stuff in the hypergraph. And so we've had examples now where you can tease apart a little bit 
here's stuff that you can consider to be on the fiber, here's stuff you can consider to be in the base space. And when we start looking at that, we get all the kind of effects of gauge invariance and all these kinds of symmetry principles and so on, they all start to come out. But that's a, that's a complicated piece of mathematical physics to tease all these pieces apart and to really see how those limits work. And, and hopefully we'll get a leg up from some of the existing development in mathematical physics in those areas. Uh, Philip asks, what pushes updating in time? Why does it evolve at all? Um, a reasonable question. I think the way to think about it is, why does two plus two turn into four? It just is four. There is a sense in which there is, it isn't that something pushes it to be four, it just is. And I think that's the sense, that's at least my best verbalization of the sense in which it is inexorably the case that these computations, which formally have such and such a consequence, in a sense, they become their formal consequence and they necessarily become their formal consequence because it is merely that sort of necessary formal consequence, so to speak. It isn't something where there has to be a driver, a prime mover who's driving all of this. It is a necessary feature. It's like, you don't have to say what drives you know, one plus one to be two or whatever. It's, it's just, it just is that. And we can make, we can, uh, we can kind of uh, imagine the, the, the transformation of one thing to the other. When we try and describe what's going on, we say there's this transformation from one to the other, but it is something that in a sense just is. That's at least my best, my best uh, attempt at, at that question. Um, the question from Tapadia, what is retrocausality? And I don't remember what that means. So I'm sorry, I can't really, uh, sorry, I'd have to look that up. Um, let's see, David asks, if nature is finite and digital, then the Friedman cosmological model is necessarily wrong. Sure, in detail, it's wrong. Just like the Navier-Stokes equations for fluid flow in detail are wrong because fluids are made of molecules. And the, um, uh, and, but at the level of description that's relevant for you know, flying a plane or something, at least a subsonic plane, not a hypersonic plane, it's really good enough to just say, we treat the fluid as a continuous thing. You don't have to get into that level of molecules. And it's the same thing here. At the level of looking at the large scale features of the cosmology, the Friedman model is going to be just fine. It's when you're looking at more details at the very early universe, at certain limiting cases of, of what happens, then you have to pay attention to more detail. Um, okay, Memes is asking, if we could derive a, a dimensionless metric or dimensionless quantity such as the fine structure constant, can that be useful? Sure. In our models, there's basically only one parameter. And the parameter is, well, uh, there's one parameter and then a boatload of issues. The one parameter is the maximum entanglement speed. We know the speed of light in meters per second, we don't know the maximum entanglement speed. If we knew what it was, I had a rough estimate of the, that it's 100,000 solar masses per second. And it has these units of, of uh, basically mass or energy per second. Um, the, uh, uh, if we knew what it was, we would be able to determine the scale size. We'd be able to determine the elementary length, the elementary time, all these things, the elementary energy, all those, all those features. So we have that one parameter. We actually have another parameter, which is the maximum speed in Rulial space that's a different parameter. That parameter is what links computation to physics. That parameter is what tells us what is the raw computation speed of the universe. And that has its own. So once we have those two parameters that tell us the scale of, uh, of Branchial space and the scale of Rulial space with respect to time, they basically are transforming just as the speed of light tells us the size of physical space relative to time. They say in a given time, in one second, light will go three times 10 to the eight meters or whatever. Um, the, um, that is telling us the scale of physical space given time. So the maximum entanglement speed tells us the scale of branchial space given time. The, the, uh, the, the maximum Rulial speed tells us the size of Rulial space given time, which is the maximum speed of translation, which is essentially the maximum speed of computation. So those are, those are parameters we need from our models and, and hopefully we'll be able to find those by some clever experiment. 
Now we have another thing, which is we need to parameterize the observer. And that's a, a potentially messier thing, although the big surprise is you don't need to know much about the observer to conclude a lot about the laws of physics. But just how much we will have to know about the observer, just how honest we will have to be about how the observer observes the universe, I don't know yet. And there may be things for which we have to be more honest about the observer. By the way, this is not a new thing in the history of physics. You know, the honesty of the observer is what led to relativity. The idea that we can't determine things simultaneously, you know, the, the idea that I think Einstein got from, um, it said he got it from the fact that the Swiss trains were running very much on time and uh, as, they, as, they, as they traditionally are, but people were really worried about the fact that the clocks at one train station might or might not be synchronized by the electrical signals that go to another train station and so on. And that, you know, it's, it's making one more realistic about what exactly the observer can do. Similarly in quantum mechanics with Heisenberg and so on, the question of just exactly how do you observe the position of that thing and how long does it take you or, and, and so on. So uh, how, how, how do you observe the energy of that thing? How long does it take you to do that? Leads to the uncertainty principle. It's again a being more realistic about the observer. Now we're realizing that, that uh, thermodynamics is a consequence of sort of being computationally realistic about the observer. But um, yeah, I mean, it would be lovely to derive something. You know, I don't know what the first possibility is. I think it will be a topological fact about uh, sort of collective excitations in the hypergraph. And it will be something like, it might be the dimensionless thing you might derive might be the type of, of limiting gauge group that corresponds to the symmetries of, of the internal symmetries of physics. It might be something related to some supersymmetric gauge group thing that is the necessary limit of anything that is observed by an observer like us, for example. Or it might be something where, you know, I don't think we're going to nail the electron muon mass ratio. I don't think those are, or the fine structure constant. I think those are probably, probably fairly far out fairly big towers of actual calculation away from what actually is, is, is readily predictable in the model. But I've been wrong about this before, and it could be that those things are easier to get than I think. I keep on being pessimistic about how difficult it is to get something. You know, I, I didn't think we would have a lot of the knowledge that we have now about how these models work. But they've, they've kept on being easier than I expect, which is, well, actually, here's the thing. From a physics point of view, they've been easier than I expect. You can kind of bash through and do the simulation and get a result, and it's not totally crazy and so on. From a mathematical point of view, they are ornate and deep and difficult, and they are multi-century mathematical problems from the way I see it. And, and in fact, as we look at, you know, how do we nail down the mathematics precisely? It's really hard. And you know, how do we bash through and make sort of physics level statements that's turned out to be easier than expected. Uh, let's see, Jared asks, could gravity be the result of fundamental areas of space being updated asynchronously where more matter per area of space require more computational time? Yeah, that's more or less, I mean, I have to untangle that a little bit, but this you know, energy activity in space is the source of gravity. That's kind of the, the story of that. And this whole question about, um, uh, let's see, how does, um, uh, well, asynchronicity sort of all wraps together with the fact that we're looking at causal graphs and, and all kinds of things. It would take me, take me a little bit of time to untangle this, but I think you're roughly on the right track there. Uh, a loops says, is there a hope that AI can somehow be intelligent enough to either simulate or via simulation understand these concepts as something else beyond a computationally bounded observer? That is a very interesting question. Okay, so the question is, if an AI, okay, here's a bad case limit of that. Let's make an AI that is a very sophisticated computer and let's put it to work in understanding the universe. Actually, the AI is such a sophisticated computer that it is the computer that is the universe. Then, well, by golly, the AI doesn't have any difficulty simulating the universe because it is the universe. It is the AI simply is doing the same computation as the universe. And we call it an AI because we know it's computational. Okay, so clearly that's not a useful scenario because that hasn't succeeded in linking 
what the AI does to what we care about, which is us humans being able to understand what's going on. So really the, the question you're asking is, can we use an AI as an intermediary to go from what happens in the universe to our understanding or our questions about what's going on? Because it's not difficult to have the generalized AI, the, the computational system that kind of does everything in the universe. What's difficult is to do everything in the universe it would, in a way that's connected to the way we think about things. Now, by the way, my life work basically of building our computational language, well from language, um, is, has to do with essentially making such a bridge. It has to do with finding ways to parse, to, to make a computational observer, so to speak, that is described, that is the thing that our computational language can describe. We're saying there's this computational universe of possible computations out there. Which parts of that do we humans care about? Which parts of that do we humans want to reason in terms of? What I've tried to do in designing our computational language is to pull out those features, which are the ones that we humans care about. So we have a language that allows us to do the things that we care about in the computational universe of all possibilities. So now what we're asking for physics is, can we essentially make a language for describing what happens in physics that is runnable on a computer that, 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 you know, that we, can, we can computationally execute, but we can get out of it the things that we care about understanding. So you know, the question of whether uh, sort of a, a, an AI, what would it look like? The AI would say, great, I've modeled the universe. Well, bad case because I am the universe, but less bad case because I'm, you know, I don't know, 100 orders of magnitude, you know, coarser than the universe, but I've still, I managed to run this hypergraph evolution thing and I managed to get this or that feature out of it. And then you say, okay, great. Okay, AI, what does that mean you've learned about the laws of physics? And the AI is going to say, well, I can run this simulation and I can get these, these results out, but, you know, the laws of physics, I don't have any laws of physics. I just run this simulation. It does what it does. So this question of are there human connectable laws of physics is really almost a language design question. Uh, by the way, I think that the, the current generation of AI, one of the pretty interesting aspects of it is that it is very modeled. Neural nets, for example, are very modeled on the way that brains work. And the things they find easy, like recognizing objects, are the things we also find easy. And in a sense, neural nets are made in our image and they understand things about the world that are also the things we understand about the world. And so one of the interesting questions is, can we get them to understand things about the world that are further away from what we intrinsically understand about the world? And can we get them to understand those things about the world in a way that can be communicated to us? Because saying, you know, if you, if you look at the insides of an image identification network, for example, you know, it will not describe things in terms of objects and things that we have words for. It's just this big mass of bits. And we don't have a way to describe that. And, and you know, the AI would say, well, look, I've understood how to understand images. We'd say, well, look, it's just a bunch of bits. We don't understand anything from that. So there's, there's this complicated translation between these things. But it's a, it's a very interesting question. What, you know, the extent to which we can use AI to kind of move in real space and, and sort of understand and, and sort of take our understanding and make a, an extension, so to speak, that, that reaches another place? It's a very, very good question. And, um, and something where, again, the question was asked earlier about measurement versus data analysis. This is, again, this question of, of how much can you do crummy measurement and fix it up in the AI, so to speak. Uh, okay, Jontology is asking, could there be even hypothetically a mechanism by which the causal structure of a chemical reaction could be extracted, e.g. within a ribosome? Very interesting question, help us figure it out. My challenge to myself is, can we invent an analog of PCR that, uh, uh, that amplifies the causal structure of a chemical reaction rather than the molecular structure of a particular molecule? I mean, in, in PCR, what you're doing is you're taking this particular, you know, uh, sequence, and you are just making lots and lots of copies of it to the point where you can easily measure it. Let's imagine that there's a causal process that's happening. Can you, for example, and my, my current thinking would be, there are these so-called autocatalytic sets, self-catalyzing reactions, maybe re relevant to origin of life. Could you initiate an autocatalytic set 
through some structure of the causal graph of chemical reactions and somehow have that sort of PCR up, not actually PCR, but some analog of that where this autocatalytic set gradually amplifies itself to the place where you can measure it. That's my, my current thinking, but I think it's a really, really interesting and important question because it may turn out that a bunch of what we should be measuring in molecular biology is these kind of causal relationships. We just haven't been looking at that. We've been looking at base pair sequences. I mean, even the fact that we're looking at base pair sequences is a big advance because people didn't know until 1953 that, that you know, information could be encoded on individual molecules. Now we don't really know whether information is encoded in causal graphs and things. And maybe that's where, for example, immune memory may be associated with causal graphs. And that's, you know, that's why you can't like go extract the actual thing and see, you know, here's the memory B cell or something and it's got these characteristics. It's because it's actually encoded in some dynamic causal graph and we have to be able to measure that. Uh, let's see, question from Dany. Um, can we say something about dark matter or dark energy based on our model? Um, the, uh, um, it's, um, uh, it's a question of, of what, um, uh, so, you know, dark matter is stuff that has a gravitational effect but doesn't produce light and we don't get to, to see it with telescopes and so on. Um, the thing that um, uh, is um, the, uh, uh, we have some ideas about possibly there are particles much lighter than electrons. We call them oligons. They involve small numbers of causal edges in our models. Maybe those are associated with dark matter. We don't. We haven't made much progress on thinking about oligons, and that's a good a good topic to think about. We just haven't managed to make much progress on it. Um, in terms of dark energy, dark energy is 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 kind of negative mass stuff that is more okay. In our models, the structure of space is associated with all of this activity, all of these updates happening. They are what knit together the structure of space. If by some uh, characteristic, by, by some, uh, for some reason, there is less going on in some region of space than you would expect, that will be dark energy. Why there should be less going on in some region of space than you expect, we don't know, but that's what that would correspond to in our models, is there's less knitting going on for space. And so there is effectively a negative mass area in space. There's a question from John Tology. Um, why isn't sequentialization of time a consequence of computational reducibility of the observer? Um, I think we're, we're revealing a much more sophisticated Oscar here. Um, okay, enforcing confluence by Knuth Bendix completion dramatically reduces the computational complexity of a uh, automated reasoning system. Let me see if I can untangle that. So is sequentialization of time a consequence of computational boundedness or computational reducibility of the observer? Of the observer forcing computational reducibility on the system, um, hmm. I don't know. That this requires some untangling, which I don't think I can do in real time. Uh, quite possibly, the, the question is, is it an independent statement that the observer is computationally bounded and that the observer sequentializes time? I have assumed that those are independent statements, but maybe they're not. Um, you know, in other words, could it be the case that an alien sequentializes space but does not sequentialize time? Yeah, here's the question. The question is, could there be a depth first alien in the following sense? Rather than parsing the universe as we do by essentially breadth first search, where we say at a given moment in time, look at all space, could there be an alien who does depth first search, parses the universe in a depth first way and says, look at all time in a limited region of space. I kind of think that that happens to some extent for an object falling into a black hole, that it's seeing the whole future of the universe. Uh, maybe that's a slightly different thing, but, but this, that's a more depth first situation. Than, than we usually have. That's a more see the whole future from a particular place in space than, than, than we normally have. But, but I think what, what, what's basically being asked there is, is it an independent assumption that we 
parse the universe in a breadth first way rather than a depth first way? Is that an independent assumption, independent of computational boundedness? I'm not sure about the answer to that. I have assumed that it is, but that might not be correct. Um, Aiden, is the information idea of entropy, number of similar states, et cetera, related to the number of threads of time giving a similar state in a multi-computational system? Um, well, okay, so that is a, in, okay. Classical physics, in, in our sort of model of space-time with events happening at different places in space-time and so on, well, okay, it's, it's a little difficult. That it is related to quantum entropy, entanglement entropy, absolutely. The number of threads giving a symbol state, sync, a similar state in multi-computational model, that is the, the um, entanglement entropy of quantum mechanics. But that's not the same as the ordinary entropy in a statistical mechanical system. In the ordinary entropy in a statistical mechanical system, you're saying we're looking at these different actual things that we could imagine were separated that, I mean, they're, they're similar concepts, but one is essentially playing out in the space of all possible uh, configurations in physical space, and one is playing out in these possible threads of time. But actually, now that I think about it, there's probably a way to formulate, hmm, yes, okay. In fact, okay. Yes, uh, yes, I think that there's, there's more correspondence here than I, than I immediately thought. Um, so for example, um, one of our research affiliates on our project, Matt Kafka has been looking at um, uh, uh, hard sphere gases in terms of actually the, the original problem that I got interested, got me interested in all these kinds of things 50 years ago of looking at hard sphere gases, balls bouncing around, thinking about that in terms of causal graphs and all those kinds of things. Now there's an interesting question. Can you think about that in terms of multi-way graphs, in terms of if there was some uh, sort of uncertainty in the exact ways these balls bounced, that gives you multiple possible outputs. Can you think about that in terms of multi-way graphs? How does that relate to ordinary entropy kinds of questions? Um, and I suspect there is a way of thinking about this. I think one of the features of multi-way graphs is they generate more possible uh, uh, paths at every step, whereas in the more traditional way of thinking about a statistical mechanical system, it's like the initial conditions are where you get the diversity from, not what happens at each individual step. Although when you think about chaos theory and you think about sensory dependence on initial conditions, then you are more thinking about, well, it's, it's again, it's, it's throwing the issue somewhat back on the initial conditions, but you're, you, you could be more thinking about when you think about kind of the, the notion of kind of tubes of, of, of nearby uh, initial conditions, then you're thinking something more closer to the, the, the standard multi-way setup. Um, okay, Aaron comments, NKS, my new kind of science, seems to have stopped very close to where the physics project started. What was the big challenge in starting the physics project? Getting the right perspective, specific results, the team. Uh, you know, after I finished the NKS book in 2002, I started working on the physics project and, and I started trying to make progress on the physics project. And there were some technical issues that I ran into and so on. And I didn't understand, I didn't understand multi-way graphs well. I, I had introduced them and I had thought about them in connection with physics, but I hadn't made those correspondences. Um, and, uh, but the, the most important thing that held me back was, you know, there were a lot of different things I was interested in doing with computational language, building Wolfram Alpha, those kinds of things. And when I looked at the physics project, the, the sociological fact that at the time, people in physics were saying, look, this new NK, NKS stuff, it's irrelevant to physics. We don't know what it is. It's, it's something crazy. It's, we don't care about it. It's irrelevant to physics and it has to be wrong for physics. And so I thought about sort of the target market of physicists at the time, and it looked very unattractive. It's like these people, and people even said it, please don't do this project. If you succeed in this project, you will show that everything we've done in physics for the last 50 years was on the wrong track. I said, I don't think that's gonna happen, but that's what people believed. And so it was a very un, you know, unattractive market in a sense of, you know, I'm doing this whole project and nobody wants me to do it. So why am I doing it? 
So that was the number one reason why I didn't do it at the time. I, I had, you can go look in the, we, we, I put up the kind of working notes from back in 2004 and so on. Definite progress was being made then, but I kind of stopped because I decided nobody wants this product, so to speak. Plus I also didn't like technically some, some details about what was going on, but those probably could have been solved. And then I went off and, and lots of other good things happened like Wolfram Alpha, like Wolfram Language, like the, the whole build out of our computational language framework a lot of different things which were really exciting. And then it was, what was it, 2018 or something, I made a pretty detailed technical uh, advance that was what led us to these hypergraphs and so on. It made the model a bit cleaner. It meant that certain things where I thought it was very arbitrary in the previous model became clean. In retrospect, it was all irrelevant. In retrospect, could have gone perfectly well. If I'd really understood multi-way systems properly, I could have just gone straight from the original models with trivalent, with, with uh, tried out graphs and so on and gone straight to what we have. But I didn't see that at the time. And in a sense, it, it required, uh, and then it was important that our team, uh, Max Piskanoff, Jonathan Gorod, um, these were in, in their different ways, both made critical contributions. I mean, Jonathan, particularly in, in telling me to take multi-way systems seriously and thinking about quantum mechanics, observer in terms of what he calls the completion interpretation of quantum mechanics, in multi-way graphs and so on. That was a very important stimulus. Plus those guys telling me, look, you know, this is too important to just let it be left aside. You know, you got to work on this and, uh, and do it. And plus me getting older and more ancient and, and so on and saying, you know, I've meant to do this physics project sometime if I'm ever going to do it, I better, you know, jump in and do it now. And, and then it just turned out things went just unbelievably better than I'd expected they could possibly go. I mean, the things that happened in a space of, of uh, well, basically six months were things that I thought would take 50 years to happen. So that was, that was really exciting. And, and um, uh, you know, that really, uh, and, and, and now the kind of conceptual unlocking that's happened as a result of the things we've understood from this project are are just, uh, uh, just amazing and, and, and really things that I had never seen coming. Even in some cases, things where I had long believed quite different things were true. I mean, I think one of the great challenges in doing science is can you do science even in the face of not, uh, of, of kind of, of, of it disagreeing with what you've long believed was the case. And I think if I've been successful in science, one of the things that has been sort of uh, um, the, the uh, the the sort of the I don't know what it is the the um, uh, perhaps courage I don't know to just say hey I've I've concluded this thing in science even though it completely disagrees with what I've always believed to be the case let me take seriously what I'm concluding in the science and you know that happened in the early days of NKS of observing the fact that very simple rules could produce very complicated behavior I didn't think that would happen I was sure that wouldn't happen. But, you know, I did the experiments and that's what happened. And it took me a few years to kind of internalize that that was what was going on. And so similarly now, particularly in some of these things, well, in quantum mechanics, you know, I had this long, long prejudice based on sort of the personal ideology of, look, you know, if there are many threads of time, that means that, you know, we're just in an arbitrary thread and nothing is meaningful about what goes on. Turns out that's not true as we understand that model in more detail, but that was kind of my personal prejudice against kind of this multi-way view, multi-computational view of things. But, you know, we were kind of led to think that way. And it's like, well, take that seriously. And as it turns out, in the end, it actually doesn't disagree with my kind of perhaps ideological point of view. Now, I mean, there are other things like, for example, I've, I've long had a point of view about the foundations of mathematics that I think is in the process of getting exploded by the things that we're thinking about, about kind of bulk metamathematics. And I think, you know, where that, where those chips will fall, I don't know. But one of the things that I find interesting about science is that you, you know, if you adopt, if you adopt the right point of view, you can, you know, I'm, I'm like, okay, well, you know, there are things that I believed about mathematics. Actually, it's kind of, if it turns out that I was wrong about those things, that's probably more interesting than, oh, well, the things I believe turned out to be true. And it's, it's a certain turn of mind that, that lets one kind of decide, let's just go through and do this, even if we have all kinds of prejudices, even if we're absolutely convinced that this isn't going to be the way the chips fall, let's actually try and do it and see whether that's where the chips fall. Now, now doing that is not an easy thing. 
because there are, uh, and that's one of the things that I like so much about, uh, about using computers and about ruleology and these kinds of things is that the chips, the computer is making the chips fall. You don't get to say, oh, that system, you know, I'm, I'm sure that system doesn't behave that way. So I'm not going to go and do that extra little calculation because I'm just sure it's not going to come out that way. You just run the computer, uh, you know, run the program and it does what it does. And you then, then the, the challenge for you is, can you interpret it? And for example, in the early days of, of new kind of science, that was what I failed to do. I didn't interpret what I was seeing in terms of these simple programs showing complicated behavior, I eventually understood phenomena like computational irreducibility and the principle of computational equivalence and so on, but that took several years. And I think one of the things that we're now seeing is this attempt to understand multi-computation, the Rouliad, all these kinds of things. It's like, can one, uh, can one sort of understand them just based on uh, just based on sort of where the chips are falling and build one sort of conceptual framework around what one's seeing there. And that's, that's always a challenge to do, but it's something that uh, I think is pretty interesting. Um, Ian asks, um, uh, let's see, uh, ask to get a conversation between Lenny Suskin and Lee Smolin. I just actually recently did a, a, a live stream discussion with, with Lee Smolin um, that I thought was, was fairly interesting. I, I um, haven't seen Lenny for a long time. I haven't talked to him about our physics project actually. Um, and that's, uh, uh, yeah, maybe we should do that. I, I, you know, it, um, people seem to find these discussions that I have with people interesting. I, you know, I have a long list of people I'd love to have discussions with. I, I have to say there's a certain selfishness to that because uh, you know, I want to learn stuff from these people. And so I hope that it's interesting to kind of watch the process of learning things. Um, but I'm, I'm motivated to go ahead and, and try and learn these things. And, and yes, I, I, I probably, uh, that's, that's a, that will be an interesting discussion. Uh, Mark, could areas of philosophy be considered repositories of physical intuition when considering the definition of the observer? Non-dualism, for example, which focuses on the definition of awareness. I don't know. That's an interesting suggestion. I need to look it up. Um, I, you know, I've been sort of. Um, I would say that some of the things from from people like Kant about uh, sort of the nature of the observer and the nature of observation of the world do resonate with the kinds of things that that uh, we seem to be figuring out. Although I think our version of them is probably crisper. Uh, maybe that's just my my view. But, but yes, I'm, I'm sure there are things people have, have thought about in philosophy about trying to understand this process of us observing the world. And I really, it's a good idea. We should just make an inventory of what all those different sort of models of the observer in philosophy are and see how, the, how they correspond or don't to things that we can describe more at a more sort of mathematical level. It's a good suggestion. Um, let's see. Um, Aidan asks, time dilation arising from some of the computation being more towards updating to a new place sounds like four velocity being directed more towards space than time. Uh, gosh. Um, well, let's see. I mean, four momentum is easier to understand than four velocity because four velocity has this nasty feature that when you divide things out, there's this nasty unit vector sitting there. Um, I'm not sure I can untangle that in real time. Uh, no, I, I don't know. Um, Dane asks, what is the physical significance and manifestation of arrows in the hypergraph notation? Ah, uh, it's a good question. I mean, the arrows just represent these relations that we have. They are, they are, they are ordered relations. That's, you know, elements one, two, three, four, and we say the order matters. Now, does it matter that we say that the order matters? Probably not. My previous efforts to do this were an order not mattering representation of things. And that got very tangled up in, uh, see what, what happens in all of these models is there's a lot of floppiness. There's a lot of things that are sort of arbitrary about the model, but you need to pick a definite, make a definite choice in order to actually do computations. But in the end, the choice won't matter. But it's very confusing because you pick a choice and it seems to matter what that choice was when you do the calculation, even though it's going to all come out in the end as not mattering. But when you pick, when you make that arbitrary choice, that's a, that's a difficult thing. 
And I think this kind of structure of kind of arrows in the hypergraph and so on is, is more part of that, that particular structure that we're choosing to do this analysis than it is anything else. But it's an interesting question whether, whether those hyper edges, oh boy, um, there may be some interpret. See, see, even when you try and look at JD6 in the hypergraph, those are merely an approximation. An instantaneous hypergraph doesn't really exist. It's just something that we sample from a particular space-like hypersurface, a particular slice in a foliation of spacetime. It, it is a thing that is constructed kind of based on our decision about what corresponds to now in time. And so it's, it's a little difficult to interpret that. At least I, I don't immediately see a, see a way to, to interpret it. Uh, Mark, can you compare and contrast the Rouliad and the infinity groupoid? Um, would the universe be more efficient if it were really a hypercomputer and just provided the answers without doing the computation? Okay, comparing and contrasting the Rouliad and the infinity groupoid, uh, no, not yet. Hopefully we'll have um, more. I think they're very, very similar, very basically the same idea. Um, but uh, you know, understanding the precise correspondences and how one sort of teases them apart is, is, is something, you know, in a sense, they're coming from different places. They're being constructed in different ways, but that they may be equivalent in the same sense that you know, lambda calculus is equivalent to Turing machines and so on. Uh, absolutely, that is what I expect. About hypercomputation. So you can always say, given a computation done by a Turing machine, let's say, you can always say, well, let me just imagine that I have the answer, that I have a, a, an oracle, a hypercomputer that will just tell me the answer. How does that relate to what we're talking about here? I think the basic point is that there are indeed hyper that one can make, but the hyper has a cosmological event horizon relative to the actual Rouliad. That is, there can be no communication between the hyper and the Rouliad and the whole hierarchy of hyper hyper -Ruliads. So in some sense, I'm, I'm sort of eliding things by saying there's only one universe. Well, there could be more, there could be hyper universes, so to speak, but those hyper universes can have no connection to our universe. They are, they are forever sort of separated from our universe and, and not, not communicating with them. So in some sense, if we say what can exist, those things can presumably exist, but they are not things in which we as observers at some place in Rulial space, our position in Rulial space must be within our ordinary Rouliad, not within a hyper Rouliad. And that's the sense in which that is for us all of reality, so to speak. At least that's my, my way of thinking about it right now. Um, Wave asks, how are waveforms oscillations emergent from the hypergraph rewriting? How does the universe implement hypergraph isomorphism? Um, how are uh, color and qualia to be understood? Okay, so first point about, about um, uh, how does the universe implement hypergraph isomorphism? Yeah, well, that's the point. It's observers that implement hypergraph isomorphism. As far as the universe is concerned, it's just spewing out one way to think about it is just spewing out this giant tree of different things. It's only by virtue of us being part of that spewing out of all this tree of different things and realizing these pieces are the same, we think of them as the same, even though in some sense, in the kind of external view, not that there can be an external view, but if there could be an external view, it would look as if none of them were, were, were equivalenced together. Um, Spectral effects like color and its qualia to be understood. Well, the whole issue of qualia and consciousness, I do not understand. It's, it's on my kind of to be understood list. I'm sorry, I, I can't comment on that. That's a, that's a kind of a view of consciousness from the inside. And I don't really understand that yet. I, I was just as an exercise, I was, I was trying to think if I were a computer and I was trying to describe the world, what would, what would the computer's eye view of the world and of consciousness be? And I, I think it's kind of interesting how similar it is to our view of, of, of the world. I, I'm trying to write something about that. Maybe I'll get that, get that done soon. It's kind of a, think of it as a science fiction story from a computer's view. And since I'm, I'm not usually a writer of fiction, haven't done so since I was like 10 years old, I can't guarantee the, the quality of, of the fiction, but um, at least from the point of view of the conception, I, I'm, I'm trying to sort of think that through. Um, 
Uh, Aaron asks, what does the physics project imply about the Big Bang? Um, you know, time doesn't, time only happens by virtue of computation happening. So to say that, uh, you know, we say there is a definite rate of the flow of time because, because the universe is somehow homogeneous and we can identify a definite rate of the flow of time. In the very early universe, the, you know, it could have, we can't say from the outside, we can say how many elementary times did it take? But the notion that an elementary time is equal to 10 to the minus 100 seconds or something, that notion didn't really exist at that time. Um, and I think that um, uh, um, this question about did the universe have a slow start or a start, fast start, my guess is the universe was very connected in its, very, in its early stages. So time was, you know, there was a lot. Space was right now, it takes a long time. It takes many steps of computation to get across the universe. But in the early universe, my guess is it was very connected and it didn't take many, very many steps of time to get across the universe. And that kind of is, is sort of a, a, a dimension change version of something like inflation that it, it says, instead of imagining sort of exponential expansion in physical space, one's saying instead that what's happening is just there isn't, there is a, that the physical space is deeply connected that you don't doesn't take much time to get across physical space because it is so deeply connected in such a high dimensional kind of thing. Um, let's see, this question from Epi, but is curvature in the hypergraph in, inherent around matter because of the addition of edges above the limit of space without any gravitation, or is it because of something like gravitons? Um, well, Let's see. I mean, gravitons are obviously an emergent concept, but is there a way to think about? Yeah, I mean, in a, in a sense, the presence of curvature is because of activity, and the activity is because of energy, and the energy might be decomposable into something like gravitational radiation. At least that's that's as far as I can can get uh, with that. Let's see. We seem to have lots of other questions, but I'm I'm just. Um, uh, Atom is asking, are there candidates for the gravitational microscope? You know, Jonathan has been looking at um, uh, these supercritical black holes and trying to see whether, whether perhaps they are held together by just a few causal edges. And that's, that's the best candidate right now for a gravitational microscope is, is, is something associated with supercritical black holes. Um, but, uh, you know, that is definitely not the only possibility. I think there are other ones to do with quantum many body systems. And as I say, there might just be some real piece of cleverness, you know, something where somebody realizes that, oh gosh, in this situation where there is, I don't know, I'm just going to make it up, a piece of dark matter in orbit around a black hole that grazes the event horizon, that some bizarre thing might be possible, might be possible to see something from that. We also have these suspicions where you're mixing quantum effects and looking at things like the correlations of photons in orbit around black holes and how those quantum correlations work, but that's not so much seeing the gravitational microscope effect. Um, uh, you know, I, it, it's gonna be something really clever and we're gonna kind of kick ourselves for, for, for the fact that we didn't notice it before. I mean, I think that the, um, uh, in general relativity, the, um, the advance of the perihelion of Mercury and the bending of light around the sun, those were effects. Well, so, so can we model, you know, the bending of light around the sun, that's a story of kind of uh, the, well, that's, that was because of gravitational magnetism, because in general relativity, there's a factor of two difference in the bending of light around the sun. And it's super convenient that it was just a factor of two. It wasn't two plus the inverse Hubble constant or something, or one plus the inverse Hubble constant. It didn't have dimensions. It was just, there is now the phenomenon of gravitational magnetism, and that contributes a factor of two. If we could have a thing like that, where some kind of effect of photons in orbit around a black hole differs because there's both branchial space and physical space contributing, if there was something like that, we would kind of uh, repeat uh, sort of the, the Einstein trick, so to speak, and just be able to say there's this dimensionless thing that doesn't depend on our scale size that we can detect that shows the structure of our model. But something like the advance of the perihelion of Mercury that's because the, the, the force law of gravity is not just an inverse square, 
in general relativity, it has a one over r cube term and so on. And that causes the, the ellipse that is the orbit of Mercury to process. Um, and so a good question is, is there an analogous effect for us? Humph, humph, interesting question. Um, I would say, yeah, actually. I mean, so the thing to do is to look at, you know, what is the effective uh, for black holes, for example? Yeah, 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 this is the obvious thing. Um, I mean, in, in um, for a small black hole, um, what is the effective force law for a small black hole? And does it somehow reflect is there a way in which it deviates from what you would get with continuous with 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 um, uh, with Einstein's equations? Is there something? How small a black hole do you have to have before the inverse square law stops working? And maybe it turns out that you know the fact that Mercury is close enough to the Sun that it can see the effect of non uh, you know, non-inverse square effects. Now that's again, a complicated thing because the sun isn't perfectly spherical. There are other effects from the quadrupole deformation of the sun and so on that affect the orbit of Mercury. And you have to tease all those out to be able to figure out whether what's the general relativity effect. But, but I mean, I think, okay. So I think the analogous thing will be to look at the orbits of black holes uh, of sufficiently uh, small black holes. Um, and uh, for example, I don't know I mean, black holes formed from stars tend to be, you know, above 1.5 solar masses or whatever. But um, I, I mean, I don't know whether there's any possibility if there were primordial black holes or if there are smaller black holes. We don't know if there are smaller black holes. Seeing the merger of a smaller black hole into a bigger black hole or something, seeing gravitational radiation from those things, those are some places where there might be a possible effect. Uh, I think another thing is in a black hole merger, in the last stages of a black hole merger, well, this is more of a quantum effect, one might be able to see entanglement speed show up as a limit on the rate at which the black holes can merge because they end up being in this single quantum state. And that has to be a, a, a sort of a motion in branchial space as well as a motion in physical space. Um, okay, we should wrap this up soon, but this is, this is you're asking the, lots of great questions. Um, Abraham asks, have I ever thought about taking psychedelics to help with our projects? Uh, no, I haven't. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I, my brain has a hard enough time doing what it does without uh, uh, any kind of giant hammer bashing it in some direction or another. I think it's, it's um, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I try hard to preserve what, what, um, uh, what my brain can actually do. Um, the, uh, um, okay, Quick is asking, does the Rouliard structure imply an intelligent designer? Well, in a sense, it implies that there is nothing for a designer to do because the Rouliard is all possible formal things. And so in some sense, a designer would be, it's like, it's like the photographer is saying, let me take a photograph of this particular rock, because I'm interested in that, as opposed to all the other rocks that are lying on the desert. And so similarly here, the designer of the universe would say, hey, I'm, I'm going shopping for a universe. I want to pick those rules for the universe and not these other rules. But the story of the Rouliad is it has all the rules in it. It doesn't, there was no shopping done. There was no selection done. It's just got everything there. So it doesn't allow the possibility. It, 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 it sort of denies the possibility of a choice that was made in the construction of the universe. Now, different story about the observer. The observer, the particulars of us as observers and where we are in rural space and so on, well, that is something that is, the, that is a historical fact about us. And one can say why that historical fact and not another, I don't know whether we can say that any more than we can say, why are we at this particular place? And why do we happen to exist at this particular place in the physical universe and not that one? Um, so I think, I think that's where it kind of goes to, is there isn't really, there's no designing to be done. There is only what the choice of what position in Rulial space do the observers happen to be at? Uh, Richard is saying, could objective collapse theories be generalized by our model, by considering rural space trajectories, which locally vary the ratio of rule, two-ray rule, et cetera, with respect to observers. 
That is an interesting suggestion, quite an interesting suggestion. Um, I think, uh, well, I think that, that um, uh, just looking at sort of the, the completion rules in branchial space, that's definitely something that leads to kind of collapse, that is collapse, but, but we're not imagining. In the past, we've imagined that those completions are in the eye of the observer, not things really happening in physics. But the thing that I was recently realizing is that, that actually there's nothing that says you can't actually get essentially the analog of gravitational collapse in branchial space. What you're now suggesting is even another level, which is ruleal space, and I haven't really thought about that. Um, okay, there's a question from Bentz saying they're an experimental physicist. Is there a way to translate this to level of condensed matter physics? Uh, what's the superconducting phase transition in our model? Well, I think a more interesting question is what are bosons in our models? You know, all of the stories of superconductors, superfluidity, you know, Bose-Einstein condensation, all these kinds of things are a story of this phenomenon of even spin particles being able to have or integer spin particles being able to have, um, uh, uh, you know, having this tendency to collect in single quantum states. What's the analog? We, we've long suspected that the analog is uh, of, of fermions is divergence in branchial space and that the analog of bosons is convergence in branchial space. That somehow bosons are associated with uh, things where there is kind of, uh, where there is confluence in branchial space, where, where things where, where paths in the graph, in the, in the branchial, in, in, in the multiway graph are converging and, and fermions are, are associated with them diverging. That, that's been our, our, our suspicion. Now, could one translate that into a quantum many body effect? That's what I'm kind of suspecting might be the case. It's just like, it seems like these um, tensor networks in um, uh, that are sort of these models of quantum phenomena, um, they are like crystals in branchial space. They are particular arrangements of the kind of the quantum states in branchial space, it's like a crystal in branchial space. Could one construct something that's like a crystal in branchial space and could one see its properties? I mean, I think there might be a condensed matter kind of way of, of doing that. Now, what are the raw materials? What are the tools at one's disposal to do that? You know, how does one make, you know, just like one can make Bose-Einstein condensates by, you know, I actually don't know what the technical, I remember, gosh, I, I should know this, I don't know other than just uh, you know, refer, you know, being able to cool things down, I don't actually know what the technical innovation that made it possible to construct Bose-Einstein condensates was. I should, I should know that. But it's, it's those kinds of things that I would kind of look at in terms of, is there some way to make an organized structure in branchial space whose, whose structure we can somehow detect? And as I say, tensor networks seem to be a kind of, of crystal in branchial space. Um, and, and that's a, a sort of a possible way into that. Um, flying is asking what energy is being used when a sequence of time changes uh, changes one to the next. Okay, that's a that's you have to go several layers down to understand what's going on there. Energy in our models is simply activity. So in a sense, it's not what energy is being used. Its energy is that activity. So it's not it's not as if I mean in in um, uh, and this idea that energy is being dissipated, that's an, a higher level idea that, that involves thermodynamics and involves the notion of heat. And in our models, heat is essentially computational irreducibility. What makes the difference between mechanical work, organized energy, so to speak, and random energy, heat, that is the difference between computational reducibility and computational irreducibility. And the difficulty of sort of taking that heat and turning it to into something meaningful, that's the, the, the challenge of finding sort of the reducible slice of a computational irreducible phenomenon. Uh, Mark is asking, would speed of entanglement be something you could observe in black hole mergers? We think so. We think with sufficiently large black holes they are partly limited. The rate at which the merger can happen is partly limited by the speed of light, but it should also be limited by the rate at which you can reach a single quantum state. And that's rate limited by the entanglement rate. And so that, that there should be some effect. There should be a deviation 
if you plot, actually, it's a good question. Somebody should do this. Just take the black hole mergers that have been observed and just see whether there is any effect of a deviation of the expected rate of the merger. Uh, I mean, it might be a little bit circular because some things about the merger, no, no, it, it shouldn't be. That you can get the, the sizes of the black holes from their orbital characteristics. I mean, yeah, that's a good thing to do. I should, somebody should do that. Just make the plot of the time to merger as a function of, of other characteristics and see whether it follows the, the predictions of continuum general relativity. I, I, presumably it follows it somewhat, but maybe, maybe by looking at all the black hole mergers that have been seen so far, one could start to see deviation and that will be super interesting. Although with our rough estimates, one would have to have kind of, uh, you know, center of a galaxy sized black holes merging, but that's based on a very rickety estimate of the maximum entanglement speed. In that case, I'm, I'm sorry to say, the, the mergers of black holes the size of the center of our galaxy have probably only happened uh, a number of times that one could count on the fingers of one hand in the history of our universe so far. And, and we probably haven't, we, we're not gonna get to see one of those, unfortunately. Um, but hopefully one could sort of tease out an effect even in smaller black holes. Um, okay. Uh, RJ is asking, it seems like physics project has momentum. Will it be the focus indefinitely from now or, or is more technology needed? You know, I think um, uh, for me personally, I have spent my life kind of alternating between doing basic science and doing technology. I have been kind of interweaving this physics project is leading us not so much to need technology to do the project, but it's giving us inspiration to build technology once we've built that technology, then for sure it will be useful in doing the project. But uh, no, I, I think you can expect to see, I, I, I've been, it's, it's really uh, kind of unfair in some sense because I just, there are so many different threads that um, I now realize should be followed. And they're things which have really been unlocked by the sort of new conceptual framework that's been provided by what we've, what we've discovered with the physics project. And it's, it's some, um, uh, it's some, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of, a, it, it just, I wanna be doing all these threads at the same time. And uh, so one question is, uh, can, I, can I induce completions between these threads? Can I find out that all these threads are really the same and by that means be able to progress all of them? And that's, um, that, that's sort of part of the story of, for example, designing sort of a multi-computational um, uh, framework for thinking about things. It's, it's kind of trying to conflate these together so we can make progress on all of them at the same time. All right, I've, I've gone on much longer than I expected, but thank you very much for lots of interesting questions and comments. And, um, uh, you know, this project is just, uh, it's just a wonderful thing. And, and a bunch of people have kind of joined the project in one form or another. Um, I think that a, a sort of a, a new direction for kind of getting involved with the project will be studying ruleology, um, which is kind of studying the raw material of what develops the intuition that eventually allows one to sort of wheel that in, not just to physics, but to these other applications of these kinds of paradigms. And, and I'm hoping to, to be able to define a little bit more kind of the, the on-ramps for ruleology um, to, to a greater extent. And I think uh, for those who are, kind of in the mathematical physics uh, domain, there's just a lot of just wonderful, wonderful things with this project. I mean, it's really, uh, to me, it's, uh, you know, I've sort of watched the progress of physics and um, I was involved in it in the late 1970s when it had a very, very energetic period to do with the, the first uses of, of quantum field theory and, and strong interactions and, and, and weak interactions and so on. Um, and I think that we are, we are, we have the raw material for just an amazing kind of golden age of, of physics uh, from sort of the, the, the different conceptual framework that we have fitting into all of these existing areas of mathematical physics, which among other things have been rather disparate. And I think that we are providing a kind of Rosetta stone that will allow those different areas of mathematical physics to fit together, which is just a really exciting thing. And from the purely computational point of view, there's both a lot of the interpretation of these ideas as computational ideas, and there's just a lot of opportunity in sort of implementing these things. And, you know, we haven't really so much run into the, we just need a bigger computer to do this, but there's certainly places like, for example, I didn't even mention the simulation of quantum field theories, 
which we're just beginning to think seriously about, there's a, a serious possibility that we may be able to do that and sort of jump beyond things like, things like lattice gauge theory and so on to a pure Minkowski uh, metric, uh, Minkowski signature kind of approach based on multi-way graphs and so on. Um, but that's going to need a sort of new ways of thinking about the actual practical computations. And that's sort of an opportunity for people who are more in the sort of computational side of things and less in the immediately sort of mathematical physics side of things. But, but these are, to me, very exciting times. And, and just a, you know, a lot of uh, a very um, uh, wonderful low hanging fruit to be picked as well as some exceptionally juicy, but higher hanging fruit a little bit further away. Um, anyway. Well, thanks for thanks for joining me for this, and um, look forward to uh, to future interactions. And I would say that the um, uh, uh, talking about all this stuff, uh, I I always find very encouraging, and I appreciate people's uh, uh, questions and, and input about it. All right, thanks very much.